Hi, everyone. Welcome to our panel session this afternoon, part of the SAPAMO um, the Gathering Online series. This is our third session. Um, our first was on digital um, uh, infrastructure in the arts as it relates to indigenous black and people of color artists and arts organizations. Our second one dealt with navigating precarity, um, more focused around where is equity um, in the arts these days uh, under the banner of Sopamo's paper, Achieving Equity or Waiting for Godot, uh, the assumption being that many of us seem to be waiting for Godot. I got tired of waiting for Godot, I wanna see some change. Um, and this panel um, really caps into the growth of this issue around anti-Black racism in the arts, uh, anti-Black racism in society, the intersections that we're now seeing between COVID-19 and the data on how this is affecting Black communities in particular, but also where we are in the arts. And one of the things that we made clear in our paper on achieving equity or waiting for Godot, that um, we do not see artists from our communities, even though we're called priorities, being treated as priorities. So for example, um, there was a bunch of money that was let in to uh, various um, um, public funding bodies, uh, and uh, we're seeing a little trickle come our way. Uh, that's not unusual for us. Um, the bigger money tends to go elsewhere, and we're supposed to be okay with what's left. Um, we're hearing, and we are saying, this, is, this time has got to stop. We can no longer exist on the crumbs on the side of the table. We can no longer um, feel good about being quote unquote priority groups while uh, we are nowhere near comparable resources, support, funding, political influence, um, et cetera, as other arts organizations that have been around for half a century, if not longer. Um, we can no longer sit back and um, allow these barriers to intrude our growth and development. And so we must speak out. And that's what today's panel is about. And we have other panels coming up in the future. And I think uh, in a week or so, we're doing one on community engaged arts. And then in August, we're doing something on indigenous arts. Um, it's our way of bringing forward the voices of artists. We've heard a lot of of uh, politicians and bureaucrats and heads of arts councils talk to us. Uh, it's our turn to talk back to them. So that's sort of what we're studying today. And before we get into the actual conversation, I'll go over the agenda and the uh, program. I want to begin with a land acknowledgement. As we know, we are on the land of indigenous peoples who have been here from time immemorial. This is the called um, Turtle Island, uh, Tai Karanto, the space that we refer to as a dish with one spoon, um, a treaty between the Haudenosaunee and the um, Anishinaabe. Uh, and looking at how this space can be shared, the resources on it for those who were in need, for those who are passing through, for those who are residing here. We in Sapamo start with that notion of the dish with one spoon because we think it speaks directly to equity uh, and to those who have greater needs or who have needs are able to take what they need to satisfy that important element. Uh, and we'd love to see society change in that way so that those who are in need can take what they need. Um, sadly, that's not the case at this point in time and which is why uh, we continue to push for, advocate, write, perform, um, you know, show artwork, exhibit artwork, et cetera, to bring forward um, the history that we have, the craft that we have, the aesthetic values that we have, um, and to engage the public in understanding the presence of persons of African descent, not only in North America, in Canada, in Toronto, but around the world, the African diaspora. With the Palmo, we've been doing this for quite some time. We've had speakers like George Elliott Clark come and talk with us. Uh, we've had um, sessions on Black arts mentorship. We've published papers by Anthony Morgan of the City of Toronto's Confronting Anti-Black Racism Unit on why Black people should not be referred to as settlers. Um, and Kevin and I have also put some papers on our work, whether Kevin's article around Caravana um, and his work with the Michaela Jean Foundation 
um, you know, around those kinds of aesthetic issues, the challenges in putting on a major festival uh, that we've known for to be an exciting uh, contribution to Toronto for almost 50 years, if not more. And uh, also looking at who are we as black people, that we're not homogenous. We come from different places. We have different languages. We have different sexual orientations. We have different arts practices. And um, it's dangerous to consider us as just one thing. And thus the creation of this panel this afternoon is we have people who come from various backgrounds, uh, whether it's from visual arts, people like Cyrus Marcus Ware, um, or uh, Pamela uh, Edmonds, um, people who are involved in multidisciplinary performances like Randall, um, centers like uh, items, uh, different book lists, uh, running programs like uh, Onika with Vibe Arts, uh, being pretty much all over the map as Kevin is with his Kasha dance and his work within the dance community and other communities, and then Gordon with visual arts, etc. cetera. So we're trying to give a very broad um, in, insight into who we are as black people in the arts, what are our challenges today, what are we achieving, and what do we need? What do we need to really be considered um, as equals within the arts ecology? How we run it is we have three speakers per hour, and um, they, each speaker will speak for about 10 minutes, and then it's time for you as members of the audience, if you wish, to ask questions or make comments. If you wish to ask a question or make a comment, Victoria Glitzer is monitoring our chat box, and we would ask that you send your question or comment directly to her. Um, what this does is it allows you to be, to, to provide your information in confidence. No one will know other than Victoria. Um, and she would only read out your question or your comment and not associate a name with it. That will go for about five minutes um, after each speaker and then we'll move on to the next speaker. Because these are in our chat box, we will be able to respond to questions we've not been able to deal with today at some later point. So we're not gonna lose anything. Um, and we certainly um, hope you won't be uh, discouraged if you don't get, if, if the speaker you've asked the question to, um, just we don't have the time to do that because you've got you know, three hours and nine speakers. Um, that's it for me, I think, in terms of opening. Um, I'm going to start with the first uh, three speakers. And our first one um, is Cyrus Marcus Ware, who will be followed by Ida Sadu. And then follow, and she'll be followed by Randall um, Ajay. Mark, it's Cyrus, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, and greetings, everybody. I'm uh, coming to you from uh, the southernmost part of Toronto, of Takaranto, the area that was underwater at the time of the Toronto Purchase and is thus unceded territory and the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, uh, I just want to start today with a story. Um, and I just want to acknowledge for everybody who's listening, this is a moment when Black artists are being asked to share our stories a lot. Uh, and there are consequences to sharing these stories. And I want, as you listen, to think about what it means for those of us who are being asked to speak out at this moment and how we, we will all hold together uh, the space to protect uh, each of us for sharing these stories. So this is a story that I want to start out from. And it comes from when I first started in my career. I've been working in museums and galleries um, for about 15 years. I've been an artist for about 25 years and an activist for, for just about as long, for 25 years. When I was first starting my career in the arts, I was working at a gallery slash school and they had been around for quite a while and they were doing a retrospective exhibition of uh, their school and they wanted to show um, uh, stories from 75 years of art-based uh, education. And um, they were doing an exhibition of photographs from uh, this sort of time period that the school had existed and they were doing an exhibition and installing it. And while I was just heading out to get a coffee, uh, one day I walked uh, through the gallery space where they were installing the exhibition and I was struck immediately by a photograph that I saw hanging on the wall, already mounted, ready and in place with no didactic and no explanation. And this is what it was. It was a photograph, a grainy black and white photograph of black children sitting on the ground playing together. It was a photograph of a slide. 
And so as a result, um, it was, you could see the slide frame and you could see the text that was written on the slide. The slide uh, title was from 1943 and was clearly visible in the photo. And the slide title was Negro Children Playing, as if these black students were some sort of exhibition in themselves. What was also shocking was that they were playing on the ground below a carving in the wall in 1943 of a swastika that was carved into the wall of this gallery school and the children were playing underneath it. And not only did people in 1943 not find a problem with the fact that there was a swastika carved into the wall of the school and these children were playing underneath it, but they had taken a photograph of it as something that they wanted to document. Right, so the inclusion of this slide title in the photo, the carving, none of this had phased anybody in the early 2000s, except for me. And I stopped in my tracks and stared at the photograph and I, I, I was trying to understand what was going on. And I thought, you know, the exhibition team, perhaps looking through photograph after photograph after photograph of white students, because there was, you know, there's often a problem where, where black students aren't getting opportunities to go to art schools and to go to, you know, these, these kind of learning opportunities. And they saw a little bit of color and they just jumped on it and decided to put it up. I'm not exactly sure. All I know is that they put this photo up in the lineup and it was hung on the wall. And so I brought it up and of course the photo was taken down. An intern ultimately took the fall for making the selection um, that of course deflected the responsibility from the rest of the team. And of course, as we know in any gallery, very rarely do interns make the decision about what gets put on the wall. That is not an intern decision, but it was an intern who ended up taking the fall for this. Um, and of course, this, uh, the labor and the risk involved in me speaking out was not recognized. I mean, I took a great risk in speaking out, but I did so because I was not prepared to create a scenario, to participate in a scenario where other Black people were going to be walking through that space and have that same visceral reaction that I had, that violent reaction of seeing the violence of this photograph being put on the wall the way that it was with, again, no explanation, no didactic, and there was nothing wrong with it. So I think this story, I wanted to offer this just to show for anybody who is still under the impression that things are, quote, not that bad in the arts, that things are uh, so much better than they have been. This was a very recent story. Yes, it was in the last 20 years, but that is very recent. I think, unfortunately, a photograph like that could probably still be put up somewhere today, people not realizing the harm that they're causing. So I wanted to talk about this because this points to what I think is the essential issue. There is a deep-rooted, structural white supremacy that is inherent in the arts. I mean, a lot of our arts institutions grew out of periods of colonialism, grew out of periods of colonial violence, and the white supremacy that is inherent in, the, in, that, in that process uh, continues today uh, in these organizations. There's a lack of accountability when uh, systemic racism is pointed out or called out, and we as Black uh, workers, as Black artists, we are often asked to keep the institution secrets, and I talk about this a lot, and what that does um, as a result. Now, I've been writing about uh, anti-racism within the museum and gallery field for about 15 years, working with other colleagues like uh, Wendy Ng, Alyssa Greenberg, um, and other folks who are trying to raise uh, the alarm that we have a crisis of anti-Blackness and white supremacy within the arts that needs to be changed. And as we did this writing over the last 15 years, it's been fascinating to see the trajectory. Because of course, when we started writing in the early 2000s, we couldn't even say white supremacy exists in the arts. Like even to say the word white supremacy was seen as extreme or, I mean, and again, I just want to remind you of the story that I just told, you know, there is no way that white supremacy is not existing in that story but we were told that white supremacy was not something in the arts, you know? So we, even just to be able to have the actual frank conversation that we're hopefully having today was not, has not been possible over the last 15 years. And so I'm very excited about this moment of change that we
we find ourselves in. We are now in a revolutionary moment, whether this is the revolution that we've all been, you know, saying, oh, when the revolution comes, I actually think it might be, but we are definitely in a revolutionary moment. Revolution is not a one-time event. And we are seeing the ground shift beneath us Every day when we wake up, something is a little bit different. We have been saying and rise, you know, calling the alarm that change is coming. We've been saying that, well, now change is here. I mean, people are literally rising up all over the planet and saying enough of the way that white supremacy has controlled and been the dominant ideology shaping most societies on this planet for the last 100 to 500 years. And people are saying, absolutely not. So this is not something that the arts is going to be absolved from. The arts is ab absolutely implicated and people are having conversations now to say, actually, you know what, what is happening around whiteness in these institutions? Why are they not changing? Why did the institutions not reflect the diversity of the communities that they're situated in? Why do they not reflect the diversity of Canada? Why are there so few black people in decision-making roles in these institutions and in cultural institutions across the country? Why are Black artists still not being given an opportunity to show, to have their work collected, to have their work critiqued, to have their work explored in public discourse? Why are we still pushing for these same things that we were pushing for 20 years ago, that we were pushing for 100 years ago when institutions like the AGO began, right? So why are we still in this situation? So I'm just very struck by this moment where now it actually does seem possible more than ever to push for the changes, the structural changes that are going to be needed. Um, there was this um, fake news that circulated around that was quickly disproved by Snopes to be not, not a true thing. But for a brief moment, there was this news article circulating a couple of weeks ago that the Seattle Museum of Art had decided to give over its board. Of, all of the board of directors had resigned and they were going to give their power over to Black artists and Black communities. And of course, for about 15 minutes, the internet was really excited for a moment. And I think that quickly, of course, we're like, oh, uh, why did we think that was even? Anyways. But just to show the possibility of this revolutionary moment that for a moment people actually legit thought that that could have happened because that is the kind of change that people are looking for. That is the kind of change that people are calling for, for an actual radical restructuring of these organizations and these institutions. And so it seems more possible now than ever. I have a colleague and friend who um, works at a major art gallery and museum uh, in New York City. And uh, her museum, as you know, of course, in the States and all around the world, really, people are taking monuments to slavery, uh, including the police system, including uh, some of these institutions, and uh, literally taking them off of their pedestals and throwing them in the river. And so this friend of mine was working at this major uh, museum that had a famous statue of someone who shouldn't be riding a horse in front of their museum. And they said to her, should we take the statue down? What should we do? And her response was, if you don't take it down, somebody's going to take it down. The activists are going to come and take it down and throw it in the Hudson. So you can either have the story of the day be that you took it down, or you can have the story of the day of that thing floating down the river and photograph after photograph of it floating away, you know, away from the institution. So that's your decision. So I think that that's the, the, the decision that a lot of institutions and hopefully folks who are listening today understand that this is the stakes here. You can either take the statue down, you can either unseat this white supremacy that is rooted in the institutions that you work in, or the activists are going to do it for you. They will literally take it down and, and take it off of the pedestal and float it down the river. So that's uh, what I want to say. I wrote a, um, a reflection a couple of years ago for C Magazine, and I'll just quickly just end by saying this. Uh, you know, I, we were talking about, and I was thinking about how there is so little writing and, and art uh, exhibitions and, and talking about this revolutionary moment. And I was writing this in 2016. Of course, now we are really in a revolutionary moment. And so I wonder what it will take for us to archive and to document and to remember this moment and how these institutions are going to capture, you know, if you are supposed to be a forum and supposed to be reflecting back the current moment and the time, how are these revolutionary moments making their way into the content and curriculum of these institutions? And so I'm very interested in this conversation. And then I'll just end by saying, telling these stories comes at a price. Right now, it is hot and sexy to be sitting down and listening to Black people talk about our experiences. That may not be the case in as early as September. And do you think that these institutions are going to forget all of the times when people like me have said, here's what's happened to me? 
there will be consequences for me speaking out. There will be consequences for all of us speaking out. And that is where your role as allies is going to be so crucial to make sure that we don't further alienate and marginalize Black artists uh, through the process of asking us to tell about what's happening right now. So I'll end it there. And I'm very excited about this conversation. And thank you so much for inviting me to speak. Thank you, Cyrus, and um, thank you for your comments. Um, I, a few people did ask me about the tone. I said, hey, it's going to be hot. So here we are. Um, Victoria, do we have any questions or comments for um, Cyrus? Mm, no questions or comments right now in the chat. Okay. All right. um, I, I do have one question, um, Cyrus, about this issue of um, Beyond the revolutionary moment, your last comment about how we, in our work, in this panel, all of us, put ourselves at risk. Um, so what concrete steps can allies take to ensure that this is not just two steps forward, 20 steps backward? You're muted. I've muted myself again. I think absolutely recognizing, first of all, what it what support looks like for Black folks in your communities who are speaking out. So, you know, thinking of making, building the relationships with Black folks in your communities who are speaking out, Black, black artists in your community, Black folks in your organization, um, and, and, and developing strategies to, right now, to start building Black people into the planning for the year so that this doesn't become the hot summer of 2020 when we talked about it for five minutes, where you're actually doing the work now to start planting the seeds for programming, for exhibitions, for things like that between now and 2022 so that then if the mood changes in September, well, you've already booked us in February. So, or not February, don't just book us in February. You've already booked us in April. You've already booked us in January. Whenever it is that you've booked us, you've already got it on the books and you've already built that concrete support in so that then if there is a bit of a backlash, we're already built into the programming. I think that that would be something that I would say. And I would say that, you know, read as much as you can and do the work to learn what good allyship looks like. We've been writing about this. People have been writing about this for 20 years. You know, just uh, read about it, learn about it, and show up. Show up in concrete ways. Oh, you're muted, Charles. <laughs> um, how do Black artists lessen the effects of consequences if art is meant as a form of expression? I think, you know, it's so interesting. I was looking at some, I, I, you're cleaning out an old storage locker and I found these paintings that I, I used to be a painter. It's so funny. I'm mostly known as a drawer and performance artist now, but I used to do a lot of painting and I found these paintings from when I was in art school and I was thinking about how critiqued I was at that time because activist art wasn't popular. It wasn't de rigueur. It was doing postmodernism. And anytime I did paintings about white supremacy or about anti-blackness, I was told that it was too overt and that I should be more subtle. So I had a lot of consequences in the academic system for just speaking out and doing what I need to do. I think that, uh, you know, right now, um, what artists can do is, I think, really weigh and evaluate uh, what uh, risk looks like uh, in your speaking out. Not everybody has to uh, do this work. And for those of us who maybe are in a bit of a different situation and who can take that risk, you know, figure out how to support those people. But I don't think that everybody has to take the same level of risks in, in at the same time. Um, and I think that, um, uh, yeah, definitely um, just, just be just be aware. Just because you're asked to share, there's also this beautiful conceptualization that Eve Tuck from Oise, uh, Indigenous scholar and activist, so brilliant, uh, writes about desire-based research versus damage-based research. So also recognizing that in our activisms and when we're asked to tell these stories, we can also tell a fuller picture of how beautiful and wonderful it is to be Black artists at this moment, and how beautiful and wonderful it is to be living in this community and to be part of these revolutionary times. And so just yeah, just to be very, very mindful of um, just because you're asked to do things, uh, you can do things in a way that protect you because these are risky times and white supremacy is no joke and it plays itself out in really violent ways um, and can dramatically affect people uh, as we know. Any other questions, Victoria, that you might have? Uh, yes, we have a question. Uh, how can allies avoid the pitfalls to tokenizing black artists? Well, I think that, you know, one of the first things is, is 
that your engagement with black art and black art making and black artists should be deep and should be continued. It should be sustained. I mean, one of the, the biggest mistakes that I think that you could make would be to think that you could hire or invite a black artist to do a small thing and consider your job done. Susan Kahan writes in this beautiful book, Mounting Frustrations, Art Museums in the Age of Black Power, about how art museums often and only during times of civil unrest engage with black artists through temporary means, so through interventions, through exhibitions in kitchen galleries, through never in the permanent collection, never you know, onto the board of directors. So I think that when we look at, at those kind of tokenizing practices of just inviting us to do temporary interventions that don't affect the structural change, you could actually say, okay, well, you know, instead of doing that, because that is definitely tokenizing, how do we bring black artists into our decision-making team? How do we bring black artists into the structure of our organization? How do we build black artists into our permanent collection? How do we, you know, and, and do that work that actually affects the structure? We have two more questions. How can we be certain that these are truly revolutionary times rather than a time of transformation when all power in every sector still rests with the white power structure? These are absolutely revolutionary times. I think that one of the things that is true about revolution and about systems change is that it's very hard to tell if you're in it when you're in it. It's more usually a hindsight, uh, you know, perspective where you can look back and say, oh my gosh, that's when everything was really kicking off. That's when everything really changed. There is this cycle the panarchy cycle that you can study in terms of systems thinking and systems change, which is something that I teach about at Banff. Um, and it basically says that we go through the cycle system, all systems go through cycles of change and they go through periods of growth and organization and expansion. You can imagine a forest growing big and tall and getting a tall canopy of trees. And then eventually, you know, the, the system is, is, is unable to support all of that complexity and it goes through a period of collapse or change. And that's like say a forest fire. And that's the moment when we can drop a whole bunch of seeds and plant what is about to grow next out of the ashes. And so we are currently in a moment of systems collapse that was happening already because we were at the end of capitalism. That was happening already during 2020 because of COVID. We were already in a moment where there was a, you know, a rampant uh, buildup of activism around the, the movement for Black lives. So we are definitely in a period of systems change and systems collapse. And what people need to be doing now and what people have already been doing for 40 years is rapidly planting seeds for the society and the system that we want to be growing when we come out out of this fire into the next phase. Yeah, but panarchy cycle and systems change would be something to look up and just sort of help to understand where exactly we are at. We're gonna have to hold there, Victoria. Um, so please hold on to those questions that are still left and you can send them off to Cyrus and uh, get an answer back to the two. Who, uh, sorry about that. But as you know, we've got a long line up here today. Thank you so uh, much. Thank you, Cyrus. I'm really glad you started this off as you have. Uh, Ida. Hi, good day everyone and good afternoon everyone. And thank you to Pamo and Charles for your leadership in this and to all the participants and Cyrus, thank you too for your words. Um, and, and the reason that I am part of this panel today and I believe so many people who are part of the panels is that we are here because of integrity. Integrity because we know each other as fellow artists. So when the question is asked in the funding world, do black people get along? Do we work well together? The answer is a resounding yes. We work well together out of necessity. We work out of together because of a love and respect for each other and because of a love and respect for our community and because we are good at what we do and we give of our best when we work well together. So I wanna put this question up, do all black people work together and who are you working with to say that we work together well and we work together in common interests and in cluster collaborations because of all the things that I have mentioned. So we can put that piece of anti, that piece of racism to rest. We are people of integrity and that's why we are here today. And on the second note in terms of how racism affects us is the, the question of accountability. In this period and climate that we are in, accountability, it is not why we are accountable to black people or to a black community. We have mediums that handle that. People talk into your face and we talk back with each other. But the accountability question that we are wrestling with in this new time is the accountability of government, 
and of stakeholders who are making multiple promises during this time. And so we have to have that campaign to make all those promises that are being um, told or said to us, we have to have a campaign to make sure that we hold those promises to the fire. My mother is 88 years old and she cannot believe that again today, I'm coming on a forum to talk about anti-black racism and racism. Again, you coming to do that? Would them in here that already? No, right? And she wants to know, will the government keep its promises? So integrity and accountability are the two issues I wanna come out of the bat speaking to. As you are aware, a different book list uh, is an independent bookstore. And in its 20th year, it gave birth, birth to a different book list cultural center. And it gave birth because the people expressed a desire and a need, and they told us that we were a cultural center. And I'm pleased to report that the sign guy who is from the community from Trinidad rolled up one day and he placed cultural center on the windows of the bookstore and voila, we became the cult, uh, different book list cultural center because the people entrusted us with that. And so we were very excited about this process of having this new baby. And we told the world as a bookstore in our 20th year that in five years that we would have a home for this cultural center. And so we got excited about that. And then redevelopment came and gentrification came. And once again, we wrestled with the conversation of how do you locate an independent bookstore and what is the trajectory of independent bookstores, not only in our community, but anything that we do as Black artists affects everyone. People gain all the time by our collective efforts. So here we were responding to the trajectory of independent bookstores, which is not a black conversation, but an international conversation. And at the same time, we were faced of how we respond to redevelopment and gentrification. And so we got involved with developers in the city to address that. And then a very interesting thing would happen. We would go to meetings with the great art service organizations of the city, and they would have a language that we couldn't command that language. And they would say things like, I'm shovel ready. And I would sit there and I would be so fascinated that we didn't have that language as black people to say that we were shovel ready. But repeatedly, we were applying to the governments and we were speaking to corporations about supporting infrastructure, not programs, not just gang exit programs and reducing our world to crime. Or when people look at our community, whether the business community or the arts and culture community, they always seem to look us through the lens of social service. So I want to be bold today to say we are shovel ready at a different book list cultural center. I didn't come here to, today to be a pretender to the throne. All of us who showed up here, we are people who know thrones. So what I'm saying is we are in a, a fundraising campaign. So many arts organizations are in fundraising campaigns. So what we are saying to the stakeholders who are online, we want you to identify yourself. I'm giving you to Emancipation Day, August 1st. Didn't come here to pretend today. I'm even giving deadlines today, August 1st, so we can advance these conversations. And I want four people, four people, 400 years of misery to come and call me at info at a different book list.org or info at adbc.org and say to me, I'm going to have a meeting where you can sit with people where you can have access to their ears to get you advanced so that you can have the infrastructure and so that the black community can plant their roots deeper in this society and go beyond the programs. When COVID came, wow, that wasn't a setback for our community. When I wake up in the morning and I have to determine my here, that's my first pandemic of the morning. What COVID did was to further set us back. But because we come through the middle passage and we got that big pandemic in our lives, we knew that we moved forward. We created nations, we created language, we influenced popular culture. And so we embraced or we looked at COVID through the eyes of the pandemics that we came out of. And then George Floyd happened. And then we had a comeback, if you will. And so going forward in this comeback, again, we are not here to be pretenders to any throne, but we are here because we know thrones. And today our articulation has to be concrete. So I am inviting people to, how many of you, to contact us at a different Bookless Cultural Center and give us the names of four people representing 400 years so we can have the opportunity to sit down with them 
face to face with the integrity that we bring, with the accountability that we bring, so that we can have uh, this infrastructure and the raising of capital in the infrastructure. The second piece I want to go to is the fundraising, because when you're going to build a building and this funding thing seem to elude us all the time. And one of the areas that it eludes us in is whether or not you are a charitable organization to access grants. So for the funders on the call, another specific request that I have of you is that you remove that policy or that clause to say that we have to be charitable organizations in order to access funding. But here's the thing. Today is a bold day that we come in with. No pretenders to the throne again. And what I want to say today is I want some people, five of you, give me a high five of that, or four people representing those 400 years to call me again at info at adbcc.com. And this is what you're going to say. Ita, I am here to work with you, that we can work on a document that we can present to government so that we can have a simpler profit process for nonprofits in the arts and cultural sector to obtain charitable numbers. And I'm giving you that deadline of Marcus Garvey's birthday, and that is August 17th. Want to be very intentional today about how we are to respond to anti-racism and uh, to racism within the society. I love this moment because we can say racism. We can say white people and we not cursing. And white people get to say reparations. Oh my God, and you're, you're not gonna fall off the planet or lose your minds. Our children, and Martin Luther King said this, he talked about the blank check. Our children have, and young people on the streets have given us a blank check. They want us to fill in those checks. But what they have said to us, when you fill in those checks, do not maintain the status quo. Do not maintain the status quo, because this is not the world that we want to live in. That's why we are out on the street. So in my 10 minutes today, I have come boldly to say, I am tired and we are tired of reoppressing ourselves every time that we have to speak to the powers that be, uh, to tell them about our pain or lack of this and that. So I want to be bold today to invite people to join us in infrastructure building, to move governments beyond programs, to give us deadlines when they're going to meet to execute these things. I want people to be bold that we can go before government. This is a local conversation here now. And so when we move it to a provincial level, then by the time that we get to the federal level to talk to the government about the charitable numbers, boy, we will have traction. And so, Charles, I applaud you for your leadership, and I'm happy that all of us chose today to come on this panel, not to tell our pain anymore, not to, to, to say how we are feeling in our hearts anymore, but to speak to people's eardrum and to speak to the drum, which is called the heart and people's body, and to say to them, we are in a new world a brand new world. The rules of yesterday cannot apply to the world that we are living in. And your children and my children have given us a blank check to fill in that says, do not maintain the status quo, but build a new world because we are desirous to live in that. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ita. Um, getting warmer, isn't it? Um, any questions or comments, uh, Victoria? Just a second, I'm just checking. Uh, uh, can I share your inf contact information in the chat for anyone to contact you afterwards? You sure can, because that's the whole point of today, that we are moving forward. You can't have an ally and you're still standing asking for the ally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I yeah. don't see any questions, such as uh, people are thanking you for your passion and for your power. Thank you. I, I do have a, a question I'd like to uh, ask. I, I'm really um, excited by your comments, item as usual. And um, this question of um, different book lists, what stage are you at in the infrastructure development? I mean, because clearly we need many cultural centers yeah. I'm, I'm also very happy, too, that you've said we need many uh, cultural centers um, in the city and spaces and hub. This is Lillian Allen in one of her poems says this is not a one poem town. This yeah. is not a one cultural space town. 
right? We are many. We, we have big ideas and great ideas. And oftentimes, government wants to put us in a building like the Eaton Center. Where we at in the conversation, um, we are moving to 756 Bathurst Street in the spring and summer of 2022. We are in the midst of um, renovating a building. We are in the midst of having a campaign to reach that goal. But we are very clear and very intentional that in 2020, we are moving from 777 Bathurst Street or uh, uh, temporary spa facility to move into a permanent home um, of a black cultural center um, in Toronto where we can grow our deepest roots. So I encourage people, if you want to be part of this train, if you want to get involved, talk to us, see us about it. We need help because you can't, people can't do things alone. You gotta help, you gotta have help. And I'm never one when people say, you know, I did this all by myself. Oh my gosh, like freak out. I, I, I don't sign on to that. But the more important thing I wanna say though, Charles is this, that you have said, we need multiple spaces. We need the NIAs to be represented. We need all those people, the OBHSs, all those people who are desirous of having us to build infrastructure. And here's the thing, we are, it is the only place that is said, this is said in this country, I am plaque ready. That is said by English speaking Canada, whenever they speak to infrastructure and whenever they speak to heritage, I am plaque ready, I am shovel ready. And so I thank this moment that we can freely say, use those words and say that language, I am shovel ready. There was a question in the uh, larger chat box about what was the process for you working with um, developers to keep the bookstore open? Did you face any challenges or barriers around that? No, uh, no, we did not face. Uh, when, when we heard that the development, um, uh, that the Mervish Village was bought and a new developer was coming, it was one of those things that you say freak out and is another thing that you say, how do we go forward? Again, we sell books. And, and, and we sell stories of overcoming, people doing everyday things to uplift humanity. So if I'm in that sector, then I must be influenced by the things that were being sold. So I remember the very first thing that I did was to fire off a letter to West Bank. And the owner of West Bank's name was, is Ian Gillespie. And I wrote him a letter and I said, dear Mr. Gillespie, your name is Gillespie. And so we will dance with you in the spirit of jazz like Dizzy. And so we engaged like that. I'm not here to be a pretender to a throne. No, we came out of greatness. We must draw on our history. We are, as the sister, as Cyrus says, we are in a revolutionary moment, but we are in a revolutionary moment as black people every single day. Right? So now the world is talking at us. And yes, there will be repercussions, but here is the thing. Every single day when we wake up and we go through the door, we think, are we going to be penalized today for speaking up? That is the state of affairs of our lives every single day, the ongoing pandemic. Just a second, there is one more question. Okay. And it's uh, info for Freedom Train. Is it the same as last year, given COVID? Uh, the Emancipation Day Underground Freedom Train Rile um, is happening again this year. It's happening in virtual. Uh, it leaves the station in your imagination on July the 31st at 11 o'clock. The, 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 the pre-show starts at 10.30 p.m. Um, it's going to come to you through Zoom, and you're going to see it on your YouTube, a different Bookless Cultural Center feed. But we are going to have a fantastic time. And, and one of the good things that in the world that we live in right now is that our voices are not local, neither are they national, but they're international. So I'm looking forward to the train ride this year as we welcome in Emancipation Day on August the 1st. And on that day, I know a lot of people are going to be calling me about the charitable receipt and about the infrastructure. So it's going to be an awesome day for Emancipation Day. So see you all in the imagination on July the 31st and stay tuned for that. Thank you, Aisha. We're going to move on to our next speaker, Bengal. Where are you at? Hello, hello, everybody. Hope all is well. Um, I wanted to approach this conversation from 
uh, three different angles. I wear three different hats. Uh, one, I'm an artist. Uh, the second, of course, I'm an individual. And the third, uh, I happen to be the leader, leader of, a, of an arts organization um, uh, in Toronto. And so I just wanted to address and just really say racism, you know, I think is not just something, it's not just the N-word. Racism is really embedded in uh, so many different systems and structures that we uh, deal with and navigate through. And I think it's really important to, to be mindful of the mindsets, especially in the arts organizations, in terms of how colonialism still pervades the way we do our work, still pervades the way we think and show up and, and see people in the structures that are, de that are developed as well, too. Um, I also wanted to just, uh, just acknowledge that the funding world in and of itself is oppressive. And I wanted to mention that just mainly because of the fact that it really does pit organizations against one another. And not only does it pit organizations against one another, it really challenges you to tell a story uh, based on what they are looking for uh, and not always necessarily based on what the work that we're actually doing. Um, I find it to be very reactionary as opposed to preemptive. So after a shooting happens, let's flood and put a million dollars into the community. After someone gets killed, let's send these resources out. Let's create a, a crisis prevention um, or crisis response. But I'm, I'm really focused more on, on prevention or preemptive ways of approaching uh, and using and allowing these funding bodies to think, think ahead, of, to really think ahead. I think it's really challenging because what's happening is we're not addressing the issue. We're putting band-aids on these, on these issues. We're not really understanding what's happening, what people are facing. I think funding bodies could really uh, do better with having more opportunities for us to speak about our experiences, not even as artists, but as individuals. So that can influence how the funding is even being, um, being is showing up. So I wanted to start off as an artist. As an artist, often I find my time and my intellectual property is not treated fairly. And so people will pay for space, people will pay for food, people will pay for chairs, they'll even rent equipment. But when it comes to paying me and my experiences and how I show up as an artist, people don't wanna pay me fairly for what I deserve, for what I deserve, uh, number one. And uh, number two, even I guess the value, the value that I bring to a space or many artists often face this. And being someone who books a lot of talent, a lot of artists around the city, that's something that often I have to kind of navigate when I reach out to the artist and telling the artist they're only paying this. So people often say, this is an opportunity or this is a, an opportunity for you, but the opportunity really is, no, pay me. Pay me because I've been working on this for 11, 12 years. I've been putting a lot of time. What you pay me cannot even equate the value because I have to experience life as an artist and then create art from my place of pain and experience. And so I find that to be really interesting. Uh, oftentimes I get booked for different organizations and certain organizations will ask me to, to send ahead of time what my poem is about or to send a video what my poem was about. And I think, you know, understandably so, but often it's to mitigate or minimize how black my poetry is or how expressive my poetry can be because I speak real, I speak raw. And the spoken word is really about speaking truth to power. It's about, it's revolutionary, it's, it's a griot movement. And so I can, I mean, I'm not going to, but I can list off the number of organizations that have asked me to kind of minimize and uh, bring it down, tone it down a little bit, you know? <laughs> or the ones that are even hesitant to even ask me to tone it down. So I find that to be quite, uh, quite interesting. Um, as an individual, um, I'm always cautious because of, you know, my hair. I have to navigate this hair, as you guys can see. Uh, I have a beard, as you guys can see, and of course, the color of my skin. And so uh, COVID has really been something really interesting for me. You know, when I choose to wear a mask in certain spaces, uh, you can just see, uh, yes, I guess the fear of the virus, but I think it's even deeper than that. And it's a, a certain demographic of people who will choose to walk far away from me, who will choose to scrunch their face at me, who will choose to just move in ways that aren't very humane, that don't, don't make me feel like I'm a human, don't make me feel like I'm, I deserve to be seen or heard. And I find it to be really interesting. Um, there's many a times where people have, have, have said to me after I shared a poem or after I, I spoke, uh, people have said, oh, you're so articulate. I never knew you were, you were so articulate. I never thought you could be so articulate. And I think that's, again, embedded in just how we think, how we think about Black men or people that look like me in general. And I find this to be really upsetting because, you know, I've gone to school. <laughs> I've paid my dues. 
And uh, I find it to be really oppressive, actually, for someone to say, I never thought you could be so articulate. I never knew you were so articulate. Um, and, and these things really, really affect me. And I think this perspective really needs to change. Um, I'm not quite sure how this perspective can change, but I can say uh, for allies, for those who have uh, privilege, those who have the opportunity to educate, uh, one, listening, like I mean listening without even thinking. Often we're listening and thinking about what we want to say, but if you really want to be an ally, how can you sit down with a friend or a colleague and truly listen without you and come in with a blank slate, without you thinking about your preconceived notions, without you thinking about what you've been told about blackness or how black men show up. And I think it's really, really difficult to do so, but it's necessary for you to truly understand our experience, right? Our experience is very complex, is very convoluted. Inside of me are my ancestors and all the things they had to experience. I just so happen to be one of the, I'm from Ghana, my parents are from Ghana. And so being from Ghana, you kind of see about 20 years ago, uh, being Ghanaian or being African, you know, when I told people I was African, I found it to be very interesting how people would respond to me and say, you're African? Really? You know, and question it. And not only question the fact that I was African, maybe because I don't look like it, whatever that means, <laughs> whatever that means at the end of the day. Um, but my ancestors stayed on the continent. And so inside of me, there's so much, uh, like, complexities that I have to navigate, you know, and then coming into Canada and then not being accepted for who I am, but then going back to Ghana and not being accepted there either. So it's, it's quite an interesting thing. And I create art from that place, from that sense of not feeling like I belong here, but also not feeling like I belong there because I was raised here for most of my life, you know? So I create art from a, from a space of really trying to understand what it means to navigate this world, what it means to really understand life uh, through my perspective. As a leader and the director of RISE, um, I find these funding models and just the arts organization itself to be quantitative as opposed to qualitative. We want to know how many youth are coming into the space, how many youth showed up this week for the program, and we're not, we're not often uh, evaluating how that youth was able to, as an example, get a job, or how that youth was able to better their mental health, or how that youth got resources to other, uh, to other communities or other resources in the community. And I, and I really want the, not only the arts, the not-for-profit world, but also the funding that actually infiltrates the, the not-for-profit world to really be mindful of how we can make this more qualitative as opposed to quantitative. You can have two youth in the room, but if those two youth leave and they can make a difference, make a change in their community, that in and of itself is quantitative. But we need to like really understand how this really affects how programming is is created how events are developed right it it, it really upsets me i gotta say um this this time has been really interesting there's a lot of money that's being flooded uh into the country uh, and a lot of not-for-profit organizations are benefiting and i think what's sad to me is that it took this it took a man being killed on TV or several men being killed on TV. And this is just, this is just what was documented, right? Uh, this is just what was documented in order for the government to say, no, let's release money into the black community. It took so much work, like the amount of work that has been done prior to this, the amount of work that's been done for, for centuries in order for us to be seen equally, for the government to say, here's $20,000 to do a program or $100,000 to do a program, it's great but I think it can be insulting at the end of the day um, in terms of what it looks like, because these are fads, you know, about four or five years ago, youth was really sexy. So we put a lot of money into the youth, into youth sector, right? And now blackness is sexy. And so the money's gonna be put in. And as, as Cyrus mentioned earlier, come September, will this, will blackness still be as sexy? Will money still continue to flood through? I've seen some, some funds that are saying, are asking you to spend the money between April and November. And so you have six months to spend this money. And so I really question in, in that six months, can you really do the work that you're looking to do, right? Um, I've sat on many boards. I've been asked to sit on many boards while I was tokenized. And I, I, I really want to speak on my experience because of the different hats that I wear. Um, you know, I've been tokenized. I've been the only black male in the room, or I've been asked to come on this board without pay or not even on the board, but on, on a, a panel. Um, where I'm asked to speak my experiences or share my experiences because I grew up in Scarborough, 
or because uh, of my of so many different things I'm not, I'm not going to get into. Um, but just being undervalued and, and feeling tokenized. And often I don't really feel like I'm being heard. Um, but I, I really want this, band, this bandwagon model of funding, uh, this bandwagon, bandwagon model of, you know, work that's supposed to be charitable, work that's supposed to be from the heart. Um, I'm really, really, really sick of that and really address the issues, <clears throat> really address the issues from a pre preemptive approach rather than a reactionary. Um, and when I think about my organization, RISE, I wanted it to be something that spoke to my community. I've never openly said that RISE was a black organization. I wanted it to be for anybody who felt like they had a voice to come out and, and express themselves. Uh, but because of who I am and because of my team, uh, it just happened to be that predominantly uh, youth from the black community will come out. So about 90% of the youth that come out are black uh, or identify as black. And so I've always found it very interesting uh, when I show up in certain rooms where it's almost like people are doing a favor for me because I'm young and I'm black. And so, you know, when it comes to partnerships or certain opportunities, it just feels uh, more favoritism, more like a favoritism thing. But I guess to kind of wrap up my thoughts, um, I just want to say this isn't a fad. You know, this is real life. This is something I've, I've been dealing with and we, all of us have been dealing with for a very long time. And so for any arts organizations or leaders or staff that works for arts organizations, I think design thinking must be, must be embedded in every process, in every process of your programming, <clears throat> of your hiring process, of e like everything. It needs to be really embedded. And in order to do so, there has to be a lot of listening. There has to be a lot of re, de de not only decolonizing, but even just approaching it from a blank slate as if you don't know what's, what's happening, as if you don't know what we're experiencing. Because the reality is many folks don't. Um, and I guess lastly, uh, as artists, any artists that are in the room or any individuals, I really want to ask, how can you help us take this moment, this rocky moment and transform it into gold? How can we alchemize uh, this, this, this time that we're in that we may never experience again? Um, but, you know, black art is very popular. It's marketed uh, as popular, but it's not very respected. And I think that's something I want to change as well, too. Thank you, Randall. Any questions, um, comments, Victoria, from the chat room? Uh, yes, we have a question. Can you elaborate on the quantitative versus qualitative scenario? Uh, okay, so I won't call them out actually, but there was uh, this one organization that evaluates and was asking how many youth show up. You know, so quantitative is they they often ask how many youth showed up. And there was, there was no follow-up after that. It was just really, so we had X amount of youth that came out to this program. Okay, awesome. But they weren't asking about the impact that that event had. Like, I, I have the pleasure of seeing every single Monday night that one new youth comes up because they were, they were so shy or they were silenced in their community or that they were introverted and that they had the courage to come up and share their story and that they were celebrated. Like, they were celebrated as a result of just sharing their story, that their vulnerability became their, their courage, that their, their vulnerability became something that was celebrated as opposed to how many youth came out, as opposed to, you know, um, how many, like, you know, just things like that. And so I'm even just see uh, seeing Allison wrote this down, quantitative is box ticking. That's exactly what it is. It's box ticking. It's checking that, oh, uh, we helped 200,000 youth through our, 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 our funding this way. And uh, again, impact versus statistics. So Thank you, Michelle and Allison, for, for adding that. Any other questions or comments? We have maybe mm -hmm. time for one more. Yes, so I see there's a couple of comments, but I'm just going to go to the question because uh, it's, uh, I think the comments everyone can see in the chat. Uh, so the question, what does meaningful and empowering mentorship for young or emerging black artists look like or feel like to you? Well, for me, it really stemmed down to, um, you know, I believe in self-actualization. I believe all of us are here to actualize what we were given here on earth. And so um, to really mentor a black artist is to really understand their experience. And they may be closed off, but it's to be patient, to understand what is it that you've experienced? Because my art and most artists that I work with and that I know, they create art from a place of where they are. They create art from a place of who they are as a place of what they've experienced, not because they're black 
or not because of how they're deemed or seen in this community, but mainly because of what they have experienced. And so it comes down to sitting down and, and even remodeling what mentorship looks like. You know, mentorship does not, hmm, I can go on a tangent, but mentorship, I think just really needs to be centered around uh, self-actualization and helping young people see who they are outside of what the world is telling them, outside of how they're being uh, pitted against, uh, uh, how they're being pitted against one another, essentially. Um, so I, I guess that's that's really what I would I would say. Uh, there's a lot more I'd say, but I'll just I'll just leave it there. Thanks, Randall. Okay, um, we're gonna move on with Onika Powell of uh, Vibe Arts. Onika. Hi, everyone. Uh, I just want to start off by saying thank you to Sakamo for having me. Um, to the other speakers, thank you for sharing. I have the same sentiments as all of you, so I, I will try my best not to be repetitive. Um, I wanted to speak more on the representation of Black bodies in the arts sector. Uh, I started my artistic journey as a dancer at a young age of seven. <laughs> Kevin was actually, um, Kevin from Cache Dance was actually one of my dance teachers and along with Tamla Matthew, Karen Donaldson. But, you know, I was very fortunate to start dance in a community where my teachers looked like me, the directors of the company looked like me, other dancers looked like me. So I never questioned if I could ever be in those positions at those times. Um, as I got older into my teenage years, of course, um, being in high school and mixing with other people of other colors and stuff like that. Um, that's when I started to notice like the value of the type of dance that I did. So I grew up doing Caribbean, African folk, hip hop, soca, and just seeing that, you know, if you compare my dance company to a competitive dance company, you never saw those styles in that in those kind of companies. So when I fast forward now, it's hard to get those same opportunities because you learn from a, a small age, a young age, that there isn't they don't the sector doesn't value the type of style and culture that we do. Um, from high school, I started a career in dance professionally, dancing for artists music videos, movies, and then I started seeing the roles that Black people take up in film and television. It's your t token Black girl, you're the home girl, never the lead, um, you're the dancer, and that's about it. You don't hear much of our stories. Um, I've had many experiences where I might not look like the video girl, so I've been told to put on a hat cover my face and you know they appreciated me for the dance moves that I could contribute to a routine or a video but never the look of being a dark-skinned black girl. Um, from there I've danced with artists touring across Europe. Uh, I moved to even Morocco living in Africa. Someone said yes SCYD <laughs> but um, that's even more I started to realize that the representation of Black artists is very, very low. I've been in London, living in London, and you know, someone says, Oh, you know, are you trained? And it's like, Yes. Oh, what, what ballet schooler? And it's like, No, I, you know, was trained at an Afro Caribbean dance company. We had ballet training, we had jazz, everything, same as a competitive dance studio. But it's the training that I did, it was not recognized. Or the same thing, it's like you talk and it's like, oh, I, did, I didn't realize you could speak like that or you could dance like that. So being on that journey, it had made me, it, it really sparked something in me to come back to Toronto and make sure that the next generation of dancers do see themselves all throughout, whether they want to be a dancer, they want to be a director, a program, like anything that they do arts related, that they did see themselves there. Um, Due to planning a family, I shifted from being a dancer into a, a director role. I started a dance company, D-Life Dance Company, where it was similar to SCYD, where 
we focused on Afro-Caribbean folk dancing and culture, but we also, I wanted to use my network from being in the industry of entertainment and colliding the two and showing, you know, this next sector that there is talent from Malvern or from Scarborough and just to give those opportunities. Um, we have been successful for five years. From that, I, you know, speaking on what Randall says, when you are trying to make art as a career, it's hard to get compensated for your insight, your talent, your experience. So then you're often trying to balance it with a regular nine to five job as well. A lot of people, uh, people who are not black might not experience that same experience. But from there, I actually applied to Vibe Arts where I am now as the artistic director, but I actually applied as uh, administrative coordinator. And to go, I, I, always, I always like to give, give thanks to Katie, our ED, because if she never saw the potential in me, then I wouldn't be, she wouldn't have offered and said, you know what, you're actually more better fit for an artistic director position. Would you like to apply for that? And then even in that space, I still had imposter syndrome because growing up all these years, you don't see it other than when I was with SCYD, you don't see other dance companies or organizations or art organizations having black leaders. So if I didn't have the great support of other people around me, I probably wouldn't be where I am right now. But I just, I think to touch on what allies and you know funders and governments should do is just think about the representation like everyone said right now it's hot to be black and you know we stand in solidarity with anti-black racism but look at what that means being at vibe i've gone to a numerous events and i'm literally the only black person or there's like under five black people at you know big arts celebrations we see black people i've been to an event where coco got an award and it's like the entertainment was black but out of 100 people there was only like five of us sitting and being in attendance and just thinking about those things like how take come out of your privilege and see like okay how is a black person feeling in this situation or before we even get there are we making this safe is this space safe for black people um, I've joined a lot of collectives since my director position at Vibe Arts and just being a, in a lot of conversations about, you know, arts, but a lot of people missing from that conversation. So also recognizing the extra stress of a Black person coming to these conversations. I personally do not speak for all Black people. There, Black people have lots of different experience, whether you're African, Canadian, Caribbean, whatever age identification, like there's lots of experience. So not putting the pressure on a Black person to be like, oh, well, what is the Black community saying right now? Like, how do we get more Black people to come to our space? And when I get that question, I always say, how are you getting to their space? Don't always try to get Black people to come out to Toronto and come to your you know, your theater, your symphony or whatever, like come out and build those relationships. Because as much as you think that we need you, you also need us. You need us to tick those boxes off and everything. So just work on the, the relationship, listen, listen without talking. Um, sometimes listening means coming out of your role, giving up your space to give that space to somebody else to speak up. Um, you know, and also there's a lot of arts organizations serving the communities, but there's, there's no representation on the board. There's no representation in leadership roles. So, you know, don't just hire a black person, but also make use of their, exper their expertise. Um, sustainability, I would also say, but definitely just thinking about the representation and making sure that it's from a genuine place. Um, for funders, if you are going to put your money into arts organizations, I think there's a responsibility for you as well to go in and do your research. 
What does your board look like? What does your organization look like? Don't just hand money over because an organization has been there for 20, 25 years and they know what they're doing. Less work for you. It's time for everyone to kind of step it up now. Um, in terms of the government, I would also say, you know, holding organizations accountable to make sure that they're actually doing the work that they're doing. Um, and for our organizations, not only just using black people for outreach, but also just again, in an organization setting. Thank you, Anika. Any questions um, that people have for Anika and Victoria? Um, no questions. So I have one. Um, Onika, in the transition from, say, um, shifting to an administrative role, how have you found that in terms of um, support, uh, what you're learning from other Black colleagues who are in different arts organizations who may not have had the kind of support you apparently have had? Um, to add on to, I think I just said a great point, like we do work well together. Um, I found it very supportive when I got into the artistic director role at Vibe. I had Kevin, I had Letitia Rose, like numerous of other, you know, Black directors cheering me on and championing me to make sure that, you know, you got this, don't second guess the experience and, you know, it's, it's kind of discouraging because when you look at an application to be a director of an arts organization, they want you to have five years experience. But if your five years experience in a grassroots organization is not valued at this level, how are you supposed to get into those roles and positions? So, um, yeah, I think, I think for white people, it's easier to see a potential, but for black people, it's like, no, do you have the skills? Like we need you like on point now, there's no building up to it. So again, like I do appreciate vibe and you know, the sport that I've had to see the potential and groom, groom me into this role. And I, my only job now is to continue to support others and mentor others and saying like, you are capable of doing this. Let's literally take up space. We're more than just being outreach. And you're running mentorship programs now, are you not to revive? Yes, we're running a black youth mentorship program that is Specifically, Ms. Coco is actually one of our mentors for the program, but, you know, she could also speak on what I'm saying. It's, it's strategic, like, Black youth are matched up with Black mentors. Our conversations are very candid, transparent. We talk about the Black experience, the lens, and just breaking barriers. So when we talk about, you know, networking, what does it mean to network as a Black person? So if you're going to be in a space, yes, you know, there might be non-Black people that come out to be like, oh yeah, you know, I went to Africa before, or yeah, hey girl, how you doing? Like all those kind of things, like how to approach those situations, those microaggressions. Thank you. Victoria, any uh, other questions popping up? Uh, no questions, just uh, thank you for sharing your experiences and insights. Thank you, Anika. Um, our next speaker, this kind of flows in a way, is Kevin Ormsby. Um, hi, everybody. I think I know everybody on the line for the most part. Um, for those who I don't know, I will encourage you right now to turn discomfort into inquiry, which is a practice um, coming out of the Dance Exchange um, out of the United States uh, through Liz Lerman. Um, the, I want to honor something here. The emotion you hear in Onika's voice is part of the trauma she's faced as a black person working in the arts in Canada today. I'm gonna let that settle for a while. It is great to have taught her when she was coming up as seven. There's an erasure of black history in this country that is problematic and especially in the arts. Scarborough Caribbean Youth Dance Ensemble is not around anymore. I can let anyone on the call from funders, et cetera, ask why. And I want for you to ask why, and I want for you to ask and investigate and find out the reasons why. Find out the reasons why there is something called a priority neighborhood from which I'm from, Malvern. 
where those are Caribbean people, sometimes of upper middle class backgrounds, going to work, working for white organizations, and yet still they fall in this marginality that we're talking about that also exists in the arts. I'm not gonna have an easy conversation. I'm not wearing any consulting hats. I'm wearing the hat of an artistic director who runs a company who is from a, a particular generation of black artists in this country of which we might be able to count 10 on one hand. Of the dancers who are leaders who are arriving in my privilege in the same spaces that I arrived in. So there's a missing generation from probably about 94 to like 2000 of artists. Coco is probably one of those that I'm counting into this particular generation. Where we're also seeing the erasure of black dance companies because of underfunding, because of no funding, because of ridiculous systems that is problematic in this country around how arts councils were formed, around what is value, around how those values are arriving in a Eurocentric percep perception of practice. I wanna go back and I wanna read this. Until the philosophy which holds one race superior and, and another inferior is finally and permanently discredited and abandoned, there is war, Miss War. Until they're no longer first class and second class citizens of any nation, until the color of a man's skin is no more significant than the color of his eyes, Miss War. That is war made popular by Bob Marley, which was actually Haley Selassie's speech to the UN in the 19, I think 1961. And we still arrive in these particular spaces where this is problematic for us today. I wanna to counter that by saying, as I walk into many spaces and people know me, I don't have time to play with foolishness. I counter that by saying, I armor myself and my fortitude in my ancestors. And as you hear, Aita and so many others on the call talking about the ancestors and the work that has been done in the community. Bathurst and Bloor was historically a black neighborhood. If you're, if you're not familiar with that, you could do that particular work. She mentioned gentrification and we can look at how gentrification is potentially putting at risk a cultural center that was built and shaped by that community. And we should ask ourselves why. So, Bob Marley again, you got tired for some face. Can't get me out of the race. Oh man, you said I'm in your place. And then you draw a bad card. I make you draw a bad card. I make you draw a bad card. I'm bringing to the light these two songs by Bob Marley, simply to say that um, if I look back at how entrenched the systemic and racism and anti-black racism the arts is, I go back to being invited to speak at the Canada Art Summit in 2016 and was on a, con on, a, on a particular panel where it was about inclusivity and the cultural leaders of which I apparently I was one, um, was gonna be giving suggestions about how we move forward. That was 2016. And I remember saying to in that particular room, you don't get to be in here and say so you don't have the resources. You're the top 80 countries, um, 80 organizations across the country you have the resources. What you've not been doing is sharing that resources with people who are POC and in this case, black. You have the resources. And you also have in many capacities, the people who are like on the call, who are speaking, who can actually help you to amplify your organizations, your artistic practices with meaningful, engaged practice that is not about quantifying stuff, but about the qualifying of stuff, the, qua the quantity or the quality that is, that, in, that is involved in the work. And I, running an organization, have experienced it. I've taken my company on, through my own knock on wood investment, over $7,000, to, to be the first set of, of artists from Canada to arrive in the Caribbean space at the Caribbean um, Carafesta, the Caribbean Arts Festival. And in applications and conversations with Canada, um, Canada Council, the Arts Abroad Program, we were going to get the funding. We come back and did not get the funding. So my company, a very, very 11 years in, we'd make work happen all over the Western Hemisphere because of networks. 
is now owing me $7,000. All because that particular council or that particular group of people who assess that particular grant assume that there were no presenters or there were no opportunities for development in the Caribbean space. And this is the Caribbean Arts Festival, an intergovernmental festival that exists in the Caribbean for the presentation of Caribbean arts practices, of which I abstract into my Afro-contemporary form. I want to go back to something as well that I want to honor some things I'm hearing that is also part of how we look, we should be thinking about anti-Black racism in the arts. There are many people who said that they were concerned about speaking up because of rep repercussions to their own career. And that's part of the whole systemic thing where Black artists, Black leaders are afraid to speak up because of that repercussion. Where is that repercussion coming from? I just have questions, right? And I think these questions will lead to some things around what I'm curious about is incremental change in funding bodies, in structures, in organizations that are about honoring the many things that we know exist and the influence of Black arts on the culture of Canada. So if you close your eyes and say, Canada has a culture, I can guarantee you images may never come up of Black artists in that particular relationship. And that's part of the problem. I remember being in a, a council space, and I won't say where I was, when someone came up to me and asked, oh my God, you know, this new change has been happening. Like, how long have you been here? And I said, since 1796. And that person was completely confused. And I had to give the story of the Maroons from Jamaica who were sold or when captured by, in, in their revolutionary moments in Jamaica, was sent to Nova Scotia for codfish. That's why Jamaica's national dish is ackee and codfish. One actually from Africa, one that is Canadian. How does that happen? The, the fact that we say we're in a moment of revolution is, it is probably incorrect because that moment was also when more bodies came in the 60s, when those bodies came up through the Underground Railroad and when they came from Jamaica. Part of the challenge I feel we need to have as artists and have a conversation about across all organizations and the councils is about honoring the history that we're not accepting in this country, which is the contribution of black presence to the fabric of what is Canadian culture. And so it's very systemic that you would assume that this body, because it's black, doesn't understand a particular form of dance or, doesn't, or does not create in a particular way. Or when I'm asked to be in a council to speak about black dance, and I go, do you realize that it's done differently in Winnipeg than it is in Montreal and it's in Toronto? And that's based on the migratory patterns of how those directors are in those particular spaces. I find it to be an insult because you know what? You're supposed to do the work. And then we talk about aesthetics. I'm going to be even further and even call this out. I remember I was an assessor for CAFT, the training program uh, at Canada Heritage. And after reviewing and assessing black training organizations three times, I remember saying, do not invite me back again if it's going to be to review the same black organizations. Why was I not invited to re review a, a, a white or other dance form training institution? If it's about the dance, then let's make it about the dance. But clearly the dance was related to culture or was related to my blackness and my perceived knowledge of other forms. And that's also part of the anti-black racism lexicon that we need to move away from. I can go on forever. Um, I'm really curious about the ways in which we are um, addressing the problematic, like Cyrus mentions, addressing the issues and the ways in which we're creating structures for moving those particular things forward. For those who know me, they know I'm not the one. I don't walk in a room and you actually say to me, I can't assess this application because I, do, I just don't understand the form. I've been in that relationship as well, where I go, that's why you're here and as, a, as an assessor, that's why you're here as a jury member, is to assess form. And how is it that someone doing gesture is not honest to just gesture across disciplines and across form? I, as a, with a company, calling that company's privilege, understand that I'm also bumping up against a space where I don't have operating funding. I'm a project-based company doing amazing work. And I know that one day that work might cease to exist because I've not been given the same history of funding and support to continue the work 
in the capacities that I know the work should be seen. I've been marketed as an Afro-Caribbean company by a dance festival. And I had to say to them, because I have a communications background, that's you need to say Afro-contemporary or you say contemporary dance, because I also do not work solely in Afro-Caribbean movement structure. How is it that you were going to market an Afro-contemporary -com company doing a work that was a mixture of all these modern forms, ballet, dance hall, etc., as an Afro-Caribbean company? That, that, where, where does that come in? I mean, that is ridiculous. Or the fact that presenters still today will say that the forms that I work in will never arrive and will never generate audiences. But the work I'm speaking about has toured the Western Hemisphere, has arrived in the Caribbean space, and actually performed in New York when Orlando happened. So there's many challenges that we, are, we will have to deal with and address around how Canada also moves away and understand its colonial past, acknowledge it and understand that it's still, it's still further undermining, under-resourcing, under-funding, and under-supporting Black arts expressions in the country. Because we should not, at this moment, be having this conversation. But here we are. And many of the colleagues who work in dance, um, I, and I had a similar session for the, the African diaspora dance communities. If you're curious about that, uh, Coco wrote an amazing review and response to it on, on the dance current. And they were tired. The same way you hear Aita saying that she's tired. They were tired that we were actually still in this particular space now. And I will end with this, which actually was a, a tweet I made while at the Canadian Arts Summit. Um, and it was, captured, it was captured by someone else on a site. And I made a tweet that was saying, it was an image of this young guy with hat on and everything. And it says, stop talking about innovation and do something about it. So I would challenge us that we stop talking about anti-racism. And I'm speaking on the, from the council standpoint, from organizations who were actually continuing the erasure of black arts in this country. Stop talking about it and do something about it. And if you're curious about what to do with it, you have tons of people who have been on this panel. You have tons of people out there who can help guide you along the way. There's a certain unwillingness about giving up power and privilege and how that arrives in white supremacy and also in space. We're done, talk. Any questions, uh, Victoria, for Kevin? Um, well, there is a comment which says, makes me think of Kara Srinkser's brilliant work, a small, a small matter of engineering. And there is currently no questions. Uh, so, Kevin, I, I do oh, know. No, there is a question. Sorry, what? just got it. <laughs> <laughs> how, uh, can, how, how can we activate boards from the position of organizational staff? Um, how can we activate? I'm, you're assume, I'm assuming this is activation with um, Black bodies and also in staff. How can we activate boards? I think if you can activate boards by just activating them. Try to take the discomfort and just shift the shift the, the, the things around. I find in this country we're very scared for change. We're very scared to be overt about actually our expressions and our passions, and it's impeding us as in as an art sector as well. It's impeding the quality of the work that we can do because we always want to take these little cute steps to get there. That's probably part of our history of privilege that we we should question as well. I'd say if you want to animate and change organizations, you do it. And you do it by saying, it's time that you step down. You've been too long on this board. And find someone else out there who can do it. As a consultant, I know that my work, and that is another thing that I worked on, where it was so systemic, and it was really, really systemic, where my cred credentials as a consultant was being questioned because I pushed back at this very same thing. You know what to do. You just have to do it and get the confidence to do it. And it's just to simply change it. Animate it, take somebody off, put somebody on. But as is mentioned, you don't wanna do that through tokenization. I mentioned this at a council jury I was on once. Um, one is token, two is equity, two is parity, uh, three is equity. 
So if you really want to shape up your board, you really look at bringing three persons on and make sure that they're particular to maybe three particular areas that could benefit your organization. Maybe one could be good at marketing. Maybe one is good at community engagement. Maybe one is good at fundraising. And there are Black people out there who, who are, have those skill sets and capacities. You're just, not, you're just not in the same spaces where they are. And Onika already talked about that. You have to go into those particular spaces. To uh, you raised earlier about being on juries and looking at you know, um, technique. Can you talk about that a bit more? Well, oh boy. <laughs> um, I find part of the problem we have in dance and in particular contemporary dance and on juries is that there's an unwillingness to think outside of the box or to be informed about other practices outside of the ones that we're working in. And I think that's part of the privilege we have in, in Canada as well, because we get funded so much by national, provincial and or city based practices. There's not enough information and awareness about other forms out there. And so it's problematic when it comes to arriving in a room and being on a jury where someone, the first thing they're going to say is that they don't know, but you were actually sourced for that particular jury to know. You know, um, I've had those issues in many spaces where the same language around gestures or technique is not communicated the same way because of the value that jury members might have towards one particular form. And that's problematic. You know, so um, I'm always the one in the room who's like, is that still a gesture? Did you see a gesture in that dance form? And it's in the say, do you see a gesture here? Do you understand what's contemporary about it here as it is there? But I feel there's an issue with um, also educating juries and educating people across the country um, to understand contextually the many forms that exist and why hip hop is also, a, there's a technique. I think there's also something that is in our culture around where does technique live? And so technique doesn't live in black dance bodies because it's easy to do. And then you add polyrhythms and head and arm and clap and rhythm and extension and it becomes a huge thing. And I remember also saying that as well in another program saying, I don't want to hear you say that you, you cannot see why as a training institution, a dancer cannot come and train with Kesha Dance in an internship position for three months. It probably is the best thing for them because you're going to be leaving a training institution and have nowhere to, to, to dance because they will walk into a Kesha Dance class and be completely unaware of how ballet, modern dance, African dance performs is in a, something I'm calling a technical exploration. You know, and I, so I think there's also a diversification that's required um, when looking at work, when thinking about work, when also presenting work. Pamela, Edmonds, you're All right. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, I'm so inspired by this uh, conversation and um, I'm here in Hamilton in my kitchen uh, I'm senior curator at the McMaster Museum of Art, a uh, position I've held just over a year now. And um, I'm happy to be representing curators, Black curators. Um, I've worked primarily within the art gallery and museum field for about 20 years. And most of my practice has been independent. Uh, I've come to see my practice as a critical curator, uh, particularly ex exploring issues around the politics of representation and uh, really looking at how Black artists have been positioned within museums and galleries over time in Canada. And for me, it's really important and has always been important to see how um, artists within Canada have positioned Black artists and curators. For myself, I've, I started out as a visual artist, um, but as I became, as I, as I started to learn about Canadian art history, about the Western canon, I started to see like a void, the void of discourse, the void of representation and it was important to me in the 90s when I was studying to take up how artists were represented. And I really started to feel a sense of urgency about 
organizing exhibitions of black artists, my friends, the artists I knew weren't being shown in, in major museums within mainstream organizations and within galleries. And so there was a sense of urgency for me to start to organize exhibitions. And I sort of pivoted my artistic practice and got more into curating. And um, that's something that I've continued over the years. And at McMaster, um, I'm, I feel fortunate to be part of a team that is focused on equity and inclusion. Um, McMaster has one of the few um, curators of indigenous art and myself with my colleague, Rianne Chartrand, have been uh, exploring how we can decenter whiteness, how we can explore ideas around uh, colonization. And we've been doing these workshops over the past year uh, called Taking Stock, where we explore the legacies of white settler colonialism. And we've been do working with staff about decentering whiteness and really looking at how we can explore ideas of how we can represent a diversity of explorations around art and how it's being represented in the gallery space. And so it's important for us to really um, try to find a way to broaden the conversation. And so this year we are working with artists with curators we've initiated a black um, and indigenous curatorial mentorship program that we've started um, and it's important for us to really try to broaden the conversation about what we do who's being represented and um, how our museums and galleries have left us out of the conversation for a really long time and for me, what kind of spurned my, I guess my trajectory into curating was that I found that my work as a black artist was seen within the realm of education, within the realm of ethnicity, but wasn't really being engaged as, as art. You know, it seemed to be positioned within this within a political agenda and so i wanted to find a way to um position the work that of the artists that i was working with um to explore their their work within a particular aesthetic and away from the political because i feel that um the the dominant cultural and funding bodies really are positioning our work within a political agenda. And I, I was interested in supporting those works um, because I feel that this idea of the culturally diverse um, is not a level playing field. You know, um, not, not all POC artists are dealing with the same levels of discrimination. And I think that as a curator, I'm interested in this idea of being an archivist um, I feel that we, within this country, continually, um, there's a historical amnesia or an erasure that plagues us, I think, as Black and Canadian within this country. Our narratives are marginalized continuously and that we're often forgotten within even international dialogues around Blackness. And so, it became, it became something for me as a curator to take this conversation up. And so, you know, just to talk about my own personal background, my folks are from Nova Scotia. I grew up between the Maritimes and in Quebec. And I think for me, I really got, sens de got sensitized around issues around language and also around race because I grew up questioning the idea of not fitting in, about not belonging as a person from Quebec in Canada um, and someone who didn't speak the language of Quebec. And um, 
you know, this idea of belonging and questioning what that meant within Canada really never left me. And so my own family um, connected to the early black settlements, uh, the loyalist migrations to Canada from the US. And um, it was always important for me to represent and talk about the fact that black folks have been in Canada for you know, 400 plus years. And that also that slavery existed in Canada as well. Uh, I also wanted to dispel the long standing belief that as cultural workers, that we are hard to find. I'm so sick of that conversation that Black Canadian artists and curators and art historians, you know, we're here. We've been doing important and influential work. Uh, maybe out of the sight of the mainstream, but we have been working for decades. And uh, maybe our art histories have been on parallel tracks that haven't aligned with the mainstream, but, um, and maybe our um, narratives have defaulted to the community arts narrative, but that doesn't mean that they are any less academic, any less innovative or any less impactful. And um, so I have been on this trajectory for 20 years. Um, I feel that it, it is, this moment is necessary, it's urgent, but that I think that one of the issues that I'm seeing and it, it's come up in the conversation is this issue around tokenism, which I think is a real problem. Um, you know, in the 90s, when I started out as a curator, there were organizations like Cambaya, which was a Canadian uh, Black arts presentation and service organization that lasted for more than 10 years, um, that supported artists for a long time. There was the Black Film and Video Network. There was a coalition for truth about Africa. There was the diasporic African women's art a collective. There were people that were working to do this work and nobody remembers and it's very disappointing. And so for me, it's important to be a knowledge keeper, to remember those folks that have come before us and to document what they have done. And so um, for me, when I started out there as a curator, which uh, I find a lot of people outside of the art world don't understand what that is or, or what we do as curators. Um, there were very few programs um, professionally around curating. Um, but the, most of the folks that I knew that organized shows were artists because we felt the sense of urgency. So we organized shows in, in, in restaurants and shops in our apartments in co-ops in artist run centers there was a real diy approach and we really felt that we could and create our own spaces outside of the funding bodies um, and i feel like with the pandemic there's this real sense i mean even though that's unprecedented uh, these conversations feel like deja vu you know, we've done so much talking, we've done panels, we've, we've, we've had these conversations, but the, the changes within the funders, within the galleries have not happened. And so for me, um, you know, it makes me come to the conclusion that museum and galleries may want our culture, but they don't want our people there in the spaces. And that's what I'm going to call it out and say. Um, you know, and I want to find a way to um, bridge that gap. Like what, what do we really want to see happen and how can we um, have an honest conversation about how we engage moving forward. And um, I think an important part of the conversation, as I said, is this idea of tokenism. How do we move beyond that? Um, you know, tokenism gives those in power the appearance of being non-racist, even though they may champion diversity. They need to, um, I think, be honest about 
how people are positioned within um, their organizations. And I've experienced this, you know, I've been hired within organizations, but when I really want to instill some change, I've been derailed, I've been blocked, you know, when I really want to, and I've been hired to do a job, but when I want to instill the change, it's been very difficult to do so. And, you know, um, I think the difficulty of that is real. Um, and that these organizations really should address and be honest about the folks that they are hiring. And, uh, you know, it's a conversation I think that needs to be ongoing. Um, to look critically, these organizations and our organizations look to, need to look critically about um, and, exploring the, and explore their own generational trauma um, and explore their own, um, the residue of right supremacy and the way it, it permeates through our organizations. Um, as well, um, you know, an example of this is um, an open letter. I wanted to uh, bring, you know, to attention the open letter that was shared by Rhea, Rhea McNamara, who was Gardner Museum's program manager from 2016 to 2019, who outlines how um, she was put into a position to do diversity, but when it came to actually making change, she wasn't allowed to really um, have that happen. And so it's a problem. Um, we need to explore how black artistic practice also, I think, needs to be narrated on the base of aesthetic affinity rather than shared oppression. We really need to look at um, how our work is positioned beyond, um, I think, this idea of racism, but we need to also look at our cultural production and how we can put that into a larger conversation about art and art making. And so um, for me, I've always been interested in the idea of Black co collaboration as a methodology um, about sharing the idea of, of uh, or sharing a shared power dynamic. And um, last year, I was part of a group that had organized a Black curatorial forum um, with Gaetan Verna at Power Plant, Julie Crooks at AGO, Dominic Fontaine, who's an independent curator. And we organized a forum last year, which brought together close to 30 Black curators um, from across the country. And we met in Toronto, we had talks, we shared stories, we, uh, it was really a, a three-day three gathering based around our Toronto. And we really wanted to have conversations about our concerns and how we could support each other. And um, one of the, well, at the end of the, the session, or at, at the end of the event, we were going through our Toronto um, and one of the security guards stopped us to say, uh, as a black woman, she was so moved to see us and she was inspired by our presence, saying that she had never seen in all of her, I think it was like 25, almost 30 years at working at the convention center, a group of black people moving through the space as the way that we had. And, you know, it's like, when she said that to us, I think a lot of us were moved to tears because we were like, this is what we want to do. We want to be present. We want to, you know, have an impact. And, um, you know, it was, it was an important moment for us to have a presence and to be visible. And as an output of that um, event, we have penned an open letter to Canadian art institutions, um, which will be uh, presented in the upcoming issue of Canadian Art Magazine, which is doing a special Black Canadian art issue. It's edited by uh, Denise Reiner at Org Gallery and Yania Lee. 
and it's going to be focused on Black Canadian art. We have a list of demands and we want to see authentic reform and accountability. And I urge those who are interested to look out for that issue. And I, I think as curators uh, working on behalf of artists and organizations, what I want to say is stop erasing us. We are behind the scenes, but what we bring to the table is important. Um, we provide supportive roles to artists. We document culture, we build legacies. And um, I'll end with a quote by James Baldwin, who I love, who's been a source of comfort for me um, over the last while. And he says, um, hope must be invented every day. And he said, the purpose of art is to lay bare the questions hidden by the answers. And we need to keep inventing hope and to keep asking questions. And there's a lot of, you know, there's no quick fix but we have important work to do and um, we'll keep doing it. So, thank you. Thank you, Pamela. Yeah. Uh, are there any questions, uh, Victoria, or comments for Pamela? We can probably take a couple. We, um, we're at the two third point, so take a breath. We've got three more speakers. Okay. Um, but I'm sure the energy that uh, we're feeling um, is thought to be inspiring, uplifting, uh, and so on. Victoria, sorry. No. That's good. I was just going to say, yes, so we're quite a few comments and there is a couple of questions. So I'm going to go for the first questions that we received. And it's, can non-Black arts workers effectively decenter white culture? Uh, I, I feel that... Um, Well, you know, I think what's important in, in these conversations is that um, I think that, that white folks need to have conversations about whiteness. I don't know if we have to be involved in those conversations, to be honest with you. Um, I, I'm seeing a lot of conversations around anti-black uh, anti racism but I think some of those conversations have to be about decentering whiteness. And I think, uh, I can't remember who, who was the, um, the theorist, but you know, a lot of times they spoke about how black folks know white people better than white people know themselves. And, you know, it's like, I think that people need to understand their position as white as not a, it's not a normalized uh, position. It's a, it's something that is particular, you know, it's not a universal. And I think the conversation has to be about white folks examining their own whiteness. And I don't think, I don't necessarily think that black, black folks need to be involved in that conversation. I think people need, black, white folks need to examine their own whiteness. We have time for one more question. Um, is there another question, Victoria? Yes, we have another question. Uh, do you think sorry, there needs to be a focus on developing when vernacular to accurately articulate subtle, complex, or even infable types of racist, r racism and the trauma that comes from it? And if so, how this can be done through art and not just academia? That was a mouthful. Uh, <laughs> can you uh, repeat that question? You might want to hold on to that because I think that's a question that if we have some time at the end, we might be able to open that up to others to speak. I do want to make sure we've got three others to speak as well. Should I ask another question, Sam, and we can come back to it at the end? Yes, one more question, another one. Uh, so there is a couple, so I'm going to ask you uh, can you speak to the erasure of black arts in the Maritimes? In, in the Maritimes, is that what you said? Yes. Yes. You know, I think, I think the issue within Nova Scotia, I think it's very particular. Um, 
It's a historic community. Um, I think that there's a particular kind of racism that happens in Nova Scotia uh, because it's a very segregated community. Um, it's, there's a very strong and active Black arts presence in Nova Scotia, but I feel that um, I think even more than in Ontario, Black artists have been so left on the periphery. Um, you know, I was there for a long time. I worked with collectives. I tried to, you know, I worked with um, trying to create a presence for Black art in Nova Scotia. And I feel that um, it's just very difficult. You know, I think that what happens is again, this kind of tokenism, you know, um, I feel that without sort of a, a, a consistent push, and I know certain people like David Woods have been there for decades pushing for um, black artists um, through the Black Artist Network of Nova Scotia, but um, there's a real resistance to actually um, creating space for black artists and actually to put resources. Um, so, you know, it, it, it kind of works in the same model of Black History Month where it's like these, there's a, a maybe a one-off project or there's a, a, you know, maybe a particular project that happens, but it's not sustained. And I feel that there, there needs to be more pressure put on to um, organizers, galleries and museums to actually take that up. And they haven't, they haven't. And I haven't seen it since I've left there maybe 10, 15 years ago. So I don't know what to tell you about that. It's a problem, it's a problem. Thanks, Pamela. Yeah. It's interesting because Nova Scotia is one of the earliest areas um, where Blacks have, have come to this country. Yeah. Um, as Kevin pointed out, the Maroons and previous to the Maroons, those who came up with yeah. the, um, the British Loyalists, the promised land. Mm -hmm. uh, not land, but not exactly what they were promised. <laughs> That's right. We, are, um, we have three more speakers, and it's all going to be exciting, so hang on. Um, I want to introduce Gordon right now. Um, Gordon, your time. You're up. Hi. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here, and it's been amazing to listen to everyone's experiences and, and ideas and um, take it all in. It's been fascinating, and um, there's so many things, experiences that mirror my own. Uh, there's so many things that are common threads that I'm seeing, um, and there's so many things that give me hope. Um, but I want to address one thing, and first is something that Randall said earlier. Um, he said that um, he is amazing, or he's so upset when people still say to him how articulate he is, and I think Annika said that as well. I'm uh, about three or four times uh, older than Randall <laughs> and I had that said to me as a young person so I can't believe that a hundred years later after hearing that all through my youth white people are still saying to black people you sound really articulate and I was in a, a wave that came into the suburbs uh, of, of uh, outside Toronto Brampton and so I was used to hearing that in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s and it's it's disgusting that people still have this, this notion of what blackness is supposed to sound like or, or is surprised if we meet their expectations of what intelligence is supposed to be. And that to me is the perfect um, sort of entry point into talking about uh, my experiences in the art world, um, that there's still that surprise that I'm the artist uh, when people see my work. Um, there's still a surprise that my work even exists. Um, and I think people are surprised that for the longest time I was never represented by galleries. And um, 
there's a lot of things I really want to say, and it's been really hard for me to distill um, what's what I want to prioritize. And as people have talked, I mean, writing notes because my brain is being going all over the place. I feel like a, a, a person with ADHD right now because I just can't focus. Um, but I, I wanted to address some of the things that other people said, as well as talk about some of my own experiences. And I'll start off with one of my most recent experiences. So for people who don't know me, I'm a visual artist, I'm a painter, and uh, I've been painting for a number of years. And my work focuses primarily on representation of black men. And uh, my point of view is coming from the commercial art world and realizing that, you know, as soon as you start putting black people in your work, it automatically makes your work political. That, you know, and then I started thinking about that and it's actually just being a black person in Canada is being political uh, because we're taught to how to negotiate all these spaces and understand all the things that are working around us since childhood in order to understand how our society works. Um, but we're coming from a commercial artist or an art, the commercial art world in the sense of trying to approach either commercial art fairs or art galleries, I learned really, really quickly that I was being blocked. Uh, so my goal wasn't always, or my focus wasn't necessarily about funding or grants or working with um, you know, government organizations, it was going through art fairs and trying to reach commercial galleries. Um, but it was made clear to me pretty early on that there was not gonna be that much interest in my work. And even encounters with people at art fairs, there was a lot of educating that I had to do <laughs> uh, with uh, either patrons, uh, other artists, organizations, um, I learned really, really quickly that the art world is not as open as I would have assumed it would have been, um, especially coming at this point in my life. I know that one of the reasons why I was, I've been able to continue my pursuit of representation of, of, of Blackness in, Canadians art, in Canada's art scene is because I have another job. I'm an educator. I actually am a teacher with the Toronto District School Board. I teach grade two. And, um, and it's interesting because I end up having the same conversations at work as I do at, with regards to um, when I'm talking to people about art and the art world, which is involves a lot of times trying to educate people about anti-Black racism, about white supremacy, <laughs> and how in order for us to have effective change, people will have to do work that makes them uncomfortable. And it's, it's baffling to me that I still have to really get aggressive. Um, in particular, like when I'm talking about the TDSB, I've had to reach out directly to them about certain issues around racism and I've still been ignored. Um, and it's, it's, it's really frustrating because I, I wanna focus on positivity for this talk right now, um, but and I'm usually a pretty positive guy, but there's been so many things that have been happening lately that have just triggered some negative feelings. And one was, uh, the, the thing I was gonna mention was my experience with um, a magazine. I actually spoke to Charles and a couple of gentlemen on the panel here earlier this week about a magazine had reached out to me to uh, talk about um, highlighting some of my artwork, a Canadian home interior magazine. I'll just say it, it was Canadian House and Home. I think, you know, it's like Cyrus said, we, we shouldn't really be afraid to talk about our experiences and share, you know, our experiences. It's if, if people are going to make these choices, then we should call them out on it and explain, you know, they need to be held accountable. So Canadian House and Home reached out to me and asked about showing some of my artwork. And I was, you know, and then they also started talking about, you know, showing my home and, you know, part of me, the old me would have been like, oh my God, this is a great opportunity, this exposure, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, you know, after having some conversations with people before I had that phone call, I, I decided to just be direct. And I said to them, well, what's your plan? How are you planning on making this sustainable? What are you doing other than tokenistically just slotting, you know, slapping in some black people here and there? This isn't really going to be part of real change your magazine has actually been part of the cultural um, status quo. 
you know, what are you actually going to be doing to reflect non-colonial uh, sort of uh, directed or decorated spaces? And there was no plan. It was, uh, when I spoke to this person, she just said, well, there is no plan, not that I'm aware of. And I thought, everybody knows that you should at least have at least three or four checkpoints at this point, but there was no plan. And then I went back and I did some research and I looked at their Instagram. They never acknowledged that they had been, you know, um, perpetuating white supremacy in their magazine. They never acknowledged what they had done in the past. They just wanted to just now start filling in these positions and hoping that everyone would forget and just make things um, just um, magically give people this feeling that they've always been on board. But the reality is, and the information that I found out afterwards is that they, they are consciously choosing to ignore what they've done in the past. And that's what I've expect, that's what I've experienced in other areas as well. Um, so I think the tokenistic thing is a very important part. And I think as black artists and black creatives, one of the things that we need to start realizing is the ability to say no, is to look at situations and go, you have to look, live with yourself and you have to live with your decisions. And if we're really talking about making um, real change and long range changes, we really need to hold people accountable and really start letting them know that if you're not really gonna be part of the solution, you're gonna to continue to be part of the problem. So if they wanna come back to me and maybe say that they've got a whole you know, plan and what they're talking about doing and how they're gonna increase representation amongst their staff and, and whatever else, but the reality is to me that I know this is a magazine, but it's part of the bigger picture. It's part of the whole cultural shift that has to happen, that we have to look at everything that is showing, you know, that is sort of representing what, you know, quote unquote, Canadian culture is. We need to look at that and we need to start really thinking about where, how the whole system has to change in order for it to be effective. And that speaks to the commercial galleries that, um, you know, that have ignored me for the number of years. And that speaks to how the commercial galleries then feed into the major institutions as well. Um, I think commercial galleries like to pat themselves on the back by saying, oh, we, we've done a special project where we brought in some people of color and some black people. And look, we've done that. We can move on to our white roster of, act, of, of, of uh, painters and artists. And then the same thing with the cultural, cultural institutions. You know, it's a, it's a matter of, oh, we brought in an artist. Well, we brought in an artist from the United States of America. We brought in a black artist from the United States. Why aren't we, you know, doing shows? If, 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 if these major institutions are gonna be doing the shows, at least do them of Canadian black art. Um, but how many of them are actually purchasing, um, you know, these works permanently in their collections? And so the two go hand in hand. It's like this circle of, of commercial galleries not validating or affirming the value of black art and black artists. And therefore it doesn't become part of the larger picture of, of Canadian culture. So it doesn't really get picked up by the institutions. And then because the institutions aren't picking it up, nothing's really changing. So for the last seven years that I've been painting, I've just been watching people um, project this idea of, of, of cultural sensitivity, whatever you want to call it, understanding of diversity, um, but really realizing that a lot of it is just tokenistic. Uh, a lot of it is just to appease the masses so we can just kind of move on and feel that we've been represented. Um, but I don't think, um, I'm beginning to realize that a lot of places really just know how to jump through certain hoops in order to make us feel like they're doing the work when they're really not doing the work. And so that's why when I say that I'm, I'm kind of coming from a point of, of frustration right now, it's because there are some really positive things that are happening. There's some really positive things that are happening in the world. There's some really positive things that are happening for me personally. Um, but I also still understand how much work that needs to be done. And, I, and I'm not 100% sure that the so-called you know, gatekeepers you know, <laughs> if they're really willing to do the work. I had an experience recently with Nicholas Mativier, Mativier Gallery, where he made it quite clear to me that he was not going to do the work. Um, our conversation was awful. 
um, I was, it was a conversation that was, that came about because of a misstep that they had made on Blackout Tuesday and I called them out on it. And so they did the reach out to have a conversation with me. And the conversation was purely tokenistic. He, the conversation, and I'm, and I'm open about this because I, I need people to know that until, you know, they apologize again for the way I was treated in that conversation and make serious amends, then I don't understand why anyone would be willing to work with them. But the conversation I had with them, with him was offensive. It showed a lack of understanding and it showed that performative allyship is alive and well in Toronto, that someone felt that they could publicly announce that they were gonna have a, a meeting with me and then during the meeting, actually still say racist things during the meeting. And when I called him out on those things, he would get mad at me <laughs> for calling him out. So it's, that's why I'm frustrated is because there are good things. There are people that look like they're making good choices, um, but I don't really trust a lot of the things that I'm seeing right now. Um, despite the fact that being black is really sexy, as is being <laughs> said during this uh, talk, um, and I have had a lot of people reach out to me, but it's just been a little bit uh, confusing about trying to figure out um, who's really willing to do the work and if they are, if they really understand what the work involves. And I think once some people get the idea of what, how much work gets involved, that's when they glaze over. I can, you know, I've had conversations with people where as they start saying, well, let's look at, well, let's look at some of the things that we can do to dismantle white supremacy in the art world. And I can see them sort of just deadening. They just kind of start to sort of fade away because they realize that it's not just about hearts and balloons and, and positive Instagram posts. It's, it's really about making yourself uncomfortable. And I don't mean that in just, I know we say that a lot, but I mean really recognizing that you can't put everything under one umbrella of equity and think that's actually dealing with anti-Black racism. And that is so shocking to so many of the people that I've spoken to. Um, they, they really kind of just want to do this one big paintbrush. We've dealt with equity. We've made our statement. It's, um, I'm just going to share um, a couple more things, but the one main thing that I want to talk about, and as I said, I have no shame in talking about my experiences. I've always been honest about my experiences, and I'm not afraid to name names. And um, I'm really frustrated with uh, the organization, the Kingston Prize, for example, and that is a, um, a portrait prize that comes out of Ontario. And... Um, it is predominantly white. <laughs> you know, the, the people who place in the Kingston Prize are, are it's, it's, I've applied twice, I haven't gotten it, this isn't sour grapes, but it's, it's recognizing what does art look like in Canada? And you have a national portrait prize that has very little representation of non-white people. And two years ago, I, I kind of lost my mind because there were two portraits of black people completed by white people. And it, you know that's a checkbox. You know they, they check their box of diversity and they can move on. Um, and it becomes really frustrating because you realize that our, you start to feel like your, your stories and your narratives aren't really important to the whole Canadian landscape. That there is an idea of what Canadian art and what, in my case, Canadian portraiture looks like. And if it doesn't fit into those categories, then it doesn't have any value. The good thing about those experiences for me, though, is that they make me want to work harder. So every time I get rejected, my, my feeling um, as an artist is to, I'm going to prove those guys wrong. I'm going to prove those people wrong. So I just keep working harder and harder and harder. Um, but as I said, I'm also in a situation where I have a full-time job as a teacher, so I have this luxury of being able to say, I can really invest my time or certain energy and, or a certain even amount of money into what I need to do in order to improve or, or, to, or to keep fighting those fights. And I think that's what's the hard part is that the ability to keep fighting is finite. And at some point you burn out whatever, whether it's your resources or whether it's your resolve or your will, 
you do burn out. But for now, I still have that, that fight in me and I'm, I'm willing to keep taking people on um, because, you know, I always talk about my parents and they always said that, um, you know, they always raised me. And I said this earlier, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. So I feel like I've been given an opportunity to speak up, to fight. And since I'm here, I'm going to use my opportunity and my space to do that and to continue to take space up. Thank you, Brayden. Um, I think we have time for at least one question. Um, there may be others. Victoria, do we have any questions for Gordon right now? Yes, we do. Just a second. I need to scroll back to it. Do you think we are living in a time where truth and re reconciliation for black people and artists has reached the forefront? If so, what are the reparations and how can this be quantified? Right. That is a question that is really incredible and way out of my, <laughs> my expertise. Um, I don't even know how to start answering that question. It's, a, it's an incredible question. It's, that to me is like a whole panel discussion question. Um, I think, I don't know if we're really there to be quite honest with regards to, if I'm understanding the question correctly, I'm not sure if Canada's actually at the point where they're acknowledging that they need to, to make amends. Um, I don't think that our stories uh, have really reached them yet. I think an important part is that they, Canadian, well, whoever, when we say they, that they need to recognize that our stories are important and that they need to be acknowledged and they need to be addressed and the apologies need to be made. I don't know if we're there yet. I don't know if someone else wants to step in here, but I, I don't know if I have the capacity to fully answer that question. But thank well, you, it was a really good question. <laughs> it is a very uh, big question. I was involved some years ago uh, when the African Canadian Legal Clinic was looking into that issue to the turn of the century. And it was about the um, conference of the UN in Durban, South Africa on anti-racism and the impact of racism across the globe. Canada chose not to participate in that, sadly. Um, but there had been some thoughts around what could reparations look like. For example, how do we account for 200 odd years of slavery? What is the lost labor wage in that regard? Um, as Kevin pointed out earlier, the Maroons in Nova Scotia, the loyalists who came with um, the Blacks who came with the loyalists, the promised good land were given not good land. So there are all these things that people have thought of in addition to how we've been marginalized since the 1800s up to today. There are numbers and there are dollars behind it. Uh, it's a fun exploration. It's been done in the United States by people like Randall Robinson, uh, who worked with uh, Cornell West and some others. Um, and it's a hot topic. The US also did not participate in the Durban Conference on Anti-Racism either. Uh, we have two speakers. I just felt it was important to provide that, to say there has been movements around reparations for persons of African descent, um, but it's been blunted, sadly, uh, blocked at every stage. Um, Coco Marine, um, and then we have uh, Mark uh, Campbell after her. We we'll use the same format and then we will wrap up for today. I really wanna thank those who have been with us since um, 110, I know it's a lot, um, but as we are talking about, there are a number, a number of perspectives that are important to bring forward. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone's still attuned and ready to hear what we all have to say. We've got two speakers left. So um, for those of you who don't know who I am, uh, my name is Colette Murray, but everyone in the artistic world knows me as Miss Coco, or Coco for short. So um, for the past 25 years, my artistic journey has evolved from performance, dance instruction, to now writing and dance media, arts education. I'm an artistic director of an intergenerational collective to creating culturally responsive art projects and being an entrepreneur. So this is a lot. And this is on top of graduate studies, a full-time job, and being on two 
boards for arts organizations. This is a lot that I'm doing because the ancestors are calling me to do this work. I'm responsible to function in a project-based model to create work opportunities not only for myself, but also intentionally for my colleagues. With that, I have a responsibility to explain the type of arts that I do, what the diaspora means, while consciously competing with my colleagues for funding opportunities. So my work is rooted in centering identity, social experiences, and my relationship to educating the diasporic world around me because it's always urgent and it's silenced. So the socially engaged community arts work that I do, it's not only just to say that I exist, but we have been here. And I speak of the black dance history that's, that I also didn't learn growing up to the mentees that I, that I mentor because I'm bringing visibility to the creative gifts that are hyper invisible in the Canadian arts and non-art sectors and, and, and to my, committed, um, <clears throat> my commitment to teaching children, youth and adults. Yet the limitations continue as well as the dance hierarchy that's in place where ballet's at the top and the cultural diasporic work is at the bottom of that hierarchy, right? So <clears throat> the skin that I'm in, the external judgment that we as members of African Caribbean, the black community, it's a daily and it's a generational experience that our counterparts do not have to think of, yet we have to navigate the world with double consciousness. So in choosing arts as a career, I would like to live in a time where these systemic barriers are removed so we can all rise to the highest of ceilings. The fact that the cultural arts that I represent is sort of regulated to a community level or a community arts level, this is a debate about the value that Canadian arts have on ethnocultural work of African and Caribbean communities and whether it's deemed to be professional because it's not presented on stages. So I have worked tirelessly to find and create spaces where I am safe and welcome to engage in artistic expressions from the diaspora. And I do what I can to make sure that I create spaces as well for the students and the mentees that I work with. And it's now at the point where gentrification limits the spaces that we can utilize. One of the accomplished I, accomplishments I would say <clears throat> that I have noticed in the past maybe two years is that I'm now documenting stories and I'm writing about my Black colleagues in dance media and in archives. But the erasure is deep. There's a number of dance companies that I've worked with, but where are they now? And they're not written about. Um, in terms of my personal experiences, in terms of microaggressions, <clears throat> I'll give you a couple of examples in some, in some of the instances of my work. Um, one time I was commissioned for a workshop to animate a space outdoors and I had all the permits lined up, but of course I'm teaching dance instruction with live drumming and there's noise complaints. I'm hired to teach at a university workshop with live drumming in my, in my, in my workshop. And I already, and I raised the logistical needs to have the space where I could drum and then someone comes to close the door in the middle of my facilitation. Or I'm in a space or school space where a white custodian whose role is only to open the door of the room wants to share the complaint that our drumming is too loud and then lacks the due diligence in opening the door or having the washroom access consistently or even open the door on time, yet I'm a permit holder like everybody else in the building. Or if I had an invited guest that came and their appearance is questioned by such custodian about what is that in your head when it's their natural hairstyle. So these micro invalidations sends messages about whether or not I or if we belong and, and as we engage in our art. <clears throat> Some of the other barriers that I would say I have faced generally is a lack of mentorship not only within the Black community, but outside the Black community. I would say that I have had moments where my intellect has been undermined when I write or explain instances of my art and social experience, especially in academia spaces. 
when presenters, if I'm applying for a particular opportunity, that they don't understand what my work is. Or that the fact that I have to go and train abroad, which is very sporadic and costly, because the diasporic aesthetics and the forms that I work in are not taught here because the educational system shuts those forms out. Um, and then again, different dance studios, not necessarily within the, the community that I've worked with, but some of the dance studios who would undermine my foundational teaching because it's not part of this trendy movement and hype that you're seeing in the social media uh, circuit. So all this to say, some of the things that I would like to see change from the government or the funding bodies, the arts sector as a whole, is to be responsible to operate in ethical ways and to be intentional with how you reallocate and redistribute. And I ask, who are you centering? Is this like we need to have some redistribution and not toleration? Even though we are in the last few years of the UN international decade of people of African descent, I'm calling everybody to really reflect on what does that truly mean? Um, what I would also like to see is in terms of arts administration and arts management, I would like to see a number of multiple full-time positions for arts workers. We need to have more people in, in that role to eliminate precarious employment, and I would like to see pay equity. I would like black intellect and labor credited and cited, and they get credit for their arts and their advocacy. I would like to see institutions not to define the art or our artistic voices, the stories and the trajectories that we are allowed to present and allow for our ways of being in evolution. I would like to see that there isn't any reluctance in developing a national equity or strategic plan across all of the Canadian provincial arts councils that actually centers and hires us and priority groups. And training institutions that actually include African diasporic techniques because they are codified and they're, they're written histories and they're actual pedagogical strategies, right? Um, and basically to stop ignoring what our pioneers have been saying over the past few decades. They're tired and they have all right to be tired because they've been speaking about this for decades and not seeing any changes. I would like to see, oh, sorry. I would like to see like Canada's Art Council with like a black equity and advisory group and paying a number of people in the community with positions of paid consultation. Because I'm tired of hearing, this is the first black who celebrated or got this award, or the first black who got that award, or the first black that got this artistic opportunity. This, this shouldn't be happening in 2020, having firsts. And, uh, and on top of that, I would like to see more race-based data across the board. How many times have we been talking about this across sectors? It's important to really dig in and have race-based data because that's going to be the proof of how much we're put to the periphery. So it's important to think about what everyone's contributions will be to shift changes so that we as the as our Black artists and the Black arts community, our culture, our, our creativity, our intellect, they're, that they're not just sites just for the taking. Thank you. Thank you, Coco. Any questions, uh, Victoria, that came up through our chat box? Uh, yes, uh, there were a few comments and also a question. Uh, so the comment about, comments were about uh, the microaggression uh, that the uh, Black artists experience. Uh, they, might refer to, they might refer to as micro, but they're actually very impactful and they're massive in how they influence artists. Um, so that's a, a few comments were about this, and uh, we have a question, uh, and uh, can you speak about the lack of spaces for black cultural production and uh, the spaces are in terms of 
commercial spaces, not for profit spaces, and in, in, in general, affordable real estate for studio or for rehearsal mm. spaces? Yeah, that's, I think uh, uh, all of us can answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I would say for me, if I want to rehearse, <clears throat> I got to find a studio space that would allow me to play, bring my musicians and have the live drumming, and we're not going to get any complaints. That's one thing. So that's very hard to find. Um, I've seen over the years, not only within the Black community, I also seen like the Latin American community, the different spaces are lost that we can actually go to rehearse. In terms of art spaces, I live in the West End of Toronto. So if I'm going to look for spaces, either it's difficult to get permits to be in the school space or also to get access to other dance studio spaces because they also have their own programming and they also have all their studios booked up for external groups who have their own classes or their own um, <clears throat> rehearsal time as well. So I would say, given the fact that there's a lot of property development being built for condos, it's just eroding venues as a whole for the arts. And there needs to be some intentionality about building some art spaces that are, hey, why not soundproof? So we can do and make all the noises that we need <laughs> to create our art forms so that we can perform on said space, uh, stages in a corporate space, wherever we got to do our work. Um, in terms of not-for-profit, I would say in terms of a number of Black not-for-profits, I don't know if a lot of them have a lot of spaces, commercial spaces, and given COVID and the, and, and depending on the property management raising rents, is, is, is it, is there sustainability for them to keep said spaces? Because we already know from our own Black dance community of one of our pioneers losing their space because of the property management and then increasing the rent. Um, so it's a challenge all around. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We're going to have to move on to our, our final speaker, and not last but not least here, certainly an important activist and artist, Mark Campbell. Mark, you still here? Yep, I'm still here. Thank you, Charles. I just had to unmute myself. Um, and uh, I'm wondering if, if folks want to take a moment to stretch and stand and twist and turn. I'm not a, I'm not a, a dance artist, so I, I'll probably get all the terminology wrong, so don't laugh at me, Kevin. But uh, we are in for the, you know, the, the next 10 minutes, I will, I will take us home. How's that? So I have a couple of things to do. And, and, and uh, one of the things that I, I'm here to do, I feel like, is to tie together, you know, um, some of our very early speakers with some of the concerns of, of where I'm sitting. Because, I mean, I can't come after Coco. No one can come after that. So I'm, I'm going to have to sh shift the whole, the whole vibe in the house and be a little academic. But uh, what I want to say, uh, given the time that I have, is... How do 25 million people leave their home? Half of them survive. What do they do when learning to read becomes outlawed? And I can ask these questions over and over again. What, what happens when people kill you for trying to live in their neighborhood, right? People of the African diaspora have an idea of what it means to live through a pandemic, right? And we're at this revolutionary moment, right? Um, which I can reiterate from, uh, you know, at the very top of this conversation, we're in this revolutionary moment when the rest of the world know what it means to live in isolation, to be apart from your relatives, um, to be unable to, right? And this is a condition that I can confidently say people in the African diaspora have had to live with uh, long before telecommunications and cars and technology and Zoom and all these other things, we've been living in a state in which our humanity was denied. So a lot of people feel like during the pandemic, they didn't have all their freedoms and rights and liberties and these sorts of things. And I, I use this as an entry point into talking about what are we going to build next in, in this revolutionary moment? Because I think part of uh, my own diagnosis of the moment is that we are still reckoning with an idea of the arts that's so deeply indebted to Western Europe 
that's so deeply colonial that we're caught in a web of trying to argue our way out of its coloniality and, and we cannot. And what in fact, it, it, it's actually empty um, of the abilities to help people of the African diaspora continue to thrive in the ways that we were doing in 1794. In, in 1852, you know, the British government outlawed multiple kinds of drums in Trinidad. What came out of that? you know, the greatest instrument produced in the 21st century, right? The steel pan. So we've been doing this for a long, long, long time. When my ancestors uh, went into cockpit country and, you know, they weren't the Maroons that ended up coming to Canada uh, in 1794, but when they finally came to, to this place, they lived on Bathurst Street. They had to because nobody east of Bathurst was renting apartments to black people. Only the Jewish people that were on Spadina going west would rent to black people. So when you hear stories of where we're coming from um, and um, our histories being denied, we've, we've been here, we've been doing it. We haven't been necessarily um, imposing our history onto other people or forcing people through residential schools to learn our history, but we've been doing it and we've been surviving. And this is my segue into rethinking how we understand arts arts and culture as something that is not necessarily designed to be a luxury item, right? The days of high culture are dead, right? There is no high culture and low culture anymore, right? If in the middle of the 90s, scholars are writing about um, no culture, middle brow culture, right? There is no more high culture. So uh, the arts that traditionally come out of Europe is a luxury item. These arts are meant to uh, appease folks who can afford to go to these uh, luxurious uh, places to enjoy. Meanwhile, you have extempo, you have Im Im improvised pre-MCs rhyming in tents in a place where their drums were outlawed multiple times, right? So I'm suggesting that we think about the arts and, and the way I come to the arts is, is about thinking about the long game. And for people of the African diaspora, the long game isn't um, becoming a star on the art market or the long game isn't becoming the CEO of an arts council, but the long game is actually providing our grandchildren with a way to survive under conditions of duress. So those conditions of duress, whether that's, it's illegal for us to learn to read, whether it's illegal for us to leave a plantation, whether it's illegal for us to walk in Toronto at nighttime without being carted. We live under these conditions of duress and we create under the conditions of duress. So what I'm suggesting that at this moment of recovery, uh, what we're calling the post-pandemic recovery, that we think about the arts that, that come out of the African diaspora as doing something more than producing pleasure. Yes, it'll produce pleasure, but it will do more. Doing something more than being a commodity in the market. Doing something more than getting bums in seats because our grandchildren will benefit from it, right? When I think about burying ancestors and I think about the songs that we sing and, and our funerary rites. These are kinds of, this is music, right? This is music that you can't sell. It's not sheet music. It's not for sale. And it, it won't make anyone feel better, but it might allow us to put our ancestors where they need to go properly. And for us, 400 years in, or however many years in, I feel like we're at a moment where we need to say, art is no longer just for art's sake. We're not just doing this because we like it, because it looks good, because aesthetically I get props and people around my neighborhood like what I do, but really thinking about recovery as, a, as how do you continue to um, make a sense and a feeling of humanity equitable across all of these divisions that we create, whether the national boundaries or linguistic boundaries or religious. I mean, basically people want to feel like they are human. So when we, you know, when we blow the abang, when we are out in cockpit country, when we are break dancing on, on cardboard, we're trying to become human in a moment where we are systemically, legally, economically, financially denied the opportunity to live with dignity. Whether or not we master the Queen's English, and by the way, I went to school here, someone's gonna ask me afterwards, I'll just leave it there. Wherever we come from, we create these things under duress. So, as we continue to try to fit arts from the African diaspora into this model of sustainability, nonprofit, bums in seats, 
uh, Randell, shout out to Randell, you know, the qualitative measures, they don't make money for folks, right? So when we talk about uh, why are we sort of counting heads, because it, that's how you maintain the status quo. Things have to remain in a hierarchical ordering. That's the only way in which Western Europe dominates the rest of the world in which they are not a, a majority. And the, when I do the work that I do, I try to think about, you know, these poly, the polyrhythmic drumming patterns that come out of Afro-Cuba and the way in which they don't speak of Cuba or of simply the Caribbean, but they speak of Nigeria and they speak of Ghana and they speak of all these other places, but most importantly, they don't speak in a hierarchical fashion. So even if you have a master drummer, someone can be playing a different pattern and make it a polyrhythmic sound and the master drummer is no longer the master, right? There's still ways in which people create new relationships to uh, existing patterns of sound. So when I think about the, the art and the music that comes out of the African diaspora, and I will sort of lean towards thinking about music, I think about how, how do, like one of the challenges is how do, you, how do we come to appreciate and, and nourish um, arts from the African diaspora without re-erecting the hierarchies and the silos which are critical to the maintenance of colonial Western Europe's expansion. Like how do we think about polyrhythmic techniques? How do we think about flat structures? How do we think about a new relationship to things? Because COVID has been the moment where people had to think about a new relationship to their workplace, a new relationship to getting groceries, a new relationship to, you know, putting on work clothes. We, we're in this moment. This is what makes it the revolutionary moment where we're asking different kinds of questions, not how do I climb the corporate ladder? How do I pick up my kids from work and not be in traffic for two hours and still get a bonus at work? Those are the kinds of questions that I feel like we're in this moment to ask because everybody's feeling the effects of isolation. Everybody can smell the looming of death around them. The possibility of death is more and more real. So I want to cap off just by giving people an opportunity to, um, I'm not giving any answers to people, but I'm not creating any toolkits. I'm saying this is a moment of reckoning, a moment of thinking, quietly to yourself about what is your role in replicating hierarchies, cultural hierarchies? What is your role in destabilizing a status quo? What is your role in imagining a world where the arts, particularly from people of the African diaspora, is something more than a commodity that helps one get uh, capital, financial capital in particular? Um, and the, I think the last thing I, I would say is that Black artists the way my research uh, and my life has really come about in understanding as a DJ and as a curator, thinking about the ways in which Black artists create a sense of relationality. So we've had to create a different relationships to the status quo because there were times where just being a human or trying to express your humanity were outlawed. And I think about, you, you know, I think about a time when, when Frederick Douglass relates this, this story of him tricking the neighbor's boy into teaching him how to read. And he has to play these masterful games to become literate, which is illegal. It's like written into law that you cannot learn how to read. One could die for learning how to read. And I think about the relationship that Douglas has to create between himself and this other little boy that he's playing. These are similar to the relationships of which, you know, you'll find in jazz and what some of our brilliant people like Miles Davis will do with the trumpet or in turntablism, what some of our brilliant DJs will make the turntable into an instrument. And it's this, uh, the gift that I would say artists of the African diaspora can give us is thinking about new relationships to existing forms and structures so that maybe an arts council isn't about just doling out money, but maybe a metric of success is about building sustainability within a community in which it's systemically denied its own uh, implications in, in, um, in, in stunting its own um, development. And the last thing I'll say I mean, I've been uh, thinking a lot about art as an intangible cultural property and thinking about UNESCO um, and the ways that people are thinking about preserving our art forms. And we don't, uh, we're not even at the moment where we can think about preserving, you know, the work that Cambaya has done. We're not at the moment to even thinking about preserving the little bits of history that we can find of uh, artists in Canada, Black artists in Canada. Um, and I throw that out there because UNESCO is thinking about, um, they're being pushed to think about by very progressive folks about how do you, how do you preserve 
heritage, right? Um, which gets me to think about art as a form of heritage and art as a form of survival and how do we end up preserving those kinds of things because it's our grandkids that are going to want to know how did you run a nonprofit organization for 20 years on project funding, right? Um, so those are my only two or three points that I wanted to, to leave. You know, UNESCO has, um, has a stream of thinking about, when I, when I think about hip hop culture, they think about hip hop culture, not as an intangible um, form of cultural heritage, but as an expressive culture. And one of the entanglements, and I'll, I'll use that word in a different way right now, one of the entanglements of, of, of thinking about, about hip hop as an expressive culture um, is thinking about its relationship to the market and why, why we are denied the opportunity to try and preserve, right? So reggae, reggae music now has the opportunity to preserve part of its heritage because of course um, the Jamaican government was never interested in doing that kind of thing. And I throw those words about preserving heritage out there because what it does is expose the relationships between artistic creation and the marketplace and the ways in which value is only exchange value and we don't reward use value, in, uh, particularly in the arts. So, you know, part of the, what I want folks on the call, I mean, there's 159 people still remaining. I want folks to reckon with the idea of how an arts council reproduces social inequality with or without black people at the table, with or without a funding stream that says you can do a thing called uh, black arts, which you cannot do, right? Um, so I, I would leave these things with people to, to think about our implications, the relationship between COVID as a pandemic, social isolation, the, the, the stench of death all around us, and, and the kinds of things that only half of that 25 million people that, that survived the Middle Passage had to struggle with and still struggle with, which is death is all around us, which is isolated from ancestors, isolated from our original language, isolated from our original religions and being creative, using the arts to be inventive, being Im improvising a sense of humanity when, it's, when it is um, denied to us in every kind of legal form. I'll stop there. Thank you, Mark, you brought it home. Uh, Victoria, we have time for a question. What is the a question? Uh, we have a question. Uh, so I'm going to refresh it a little bit. Uh, so considering um, a lot of social issues that black people are facing, police brutality, daily violence, uh, systematic food and housing insecurity, how can arts organization uh, focus not only on representation, but also um, advocate and promote these issues? Uh, especially considering that some organizations might uh, not feel comfortable being political. Is that a question for me? Yes, is that's a question for you and to all speakers from the oh, okay. uh, um, I only take Mark's answer. Sorry. Um, okay. Kevin, uh, Kevin, Kevin, type it in. Type it in, <laughs> Kevin. Type it in, Kevin. Um, what, what I would say is, um, is a super long question, but the, the one thing that I would say uh, as a response, and it would be helpful for me to see the question again, um, would be, this is a, for me, I feel like this is a question of risk, right? How do we mitigate the risk of losing something that, you know, either our social status, um, our clout, our power, and in my mind, it, this is not a question of risk. This is a question of what kind of humanity do you want to live? What kind of people do you, so, so the question of how do we do this, this work that seems political. I, you know, I grew up as a, as a kid in Scarborough. Every day your life is political. My life is political every single day. So if you think that doing art isn't political, A, we have a problem, but B, there are people that risk their life to live and to create a sense of humanity through everything that they do, right? So. I want to point, I won't answer the question, but I will draw out the pieces of the question that, that I think need to be examined. So those parts of the question need to be re-examined about what is one afraid to lose? What's the risk? Is the risk of something that you consider valuable? What is the cost of your value? The cost of your value is the dehumanization of someone else. A J, you know, flipping the question, taking the risk, might open space for the possibility of someone to experience a sense of their own humanity. 
that's what the arts could do. And I hope I got, I didn't get all of the question and I've been able to answer only what I've been able to remember. Thank you. Kevin, you had your hand jumping up with excitement. You okay? You got a quick minute on that? Or? Well, I, 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 yes, I, I want to just say that our, everything that we should do as an artist should be political. That art is political and it's privilege that actually says that as an organization, I should can step back from my role in how I receive funding, don't receive funding, and how my parents, everybody on this call, is supporting an organization to say that the art that they do is not political and should not be political because that's taxpayers' money. I, what? Yep, there you go. Thanks, uh, everyone. Uh, we are at four, and we know it was a full afternoon, and we really want to thank those who stayed to the end. This is not the end of this conversation, obviously. This conversation is happening in a variety of spaces. Um, and what we will be doing with Sapamo, we've been working with the City of Toronto's Confronting Anti-Black Racism Unit. Um, so we will have a conference on anti-black racism in the arts in November. Um, and then part of that conference will be the Toronto Mayor's Roundtable on anti-black racism as well. Um, so some of the speakers who are here, if they're available, will be part of that, will be invited. Uh, we will have other guests as well, uh, various workshops and forums. And we don't want it just to be a day or an hour or whatever. We want that to lead toward actions from our community that will pressure and bring about the kind of structural, systemic, historic change that needs to happen, that will recognize our time here that will recognize our energy, our creativity, our resilience, our passion, our strength, our hopes, our wishes, and our realities. Um, it's gonna be a bit of a battle, but as many speakers have already pointed out, we've grown up in war, so here we go. Um, again, my great thanks to all the speakers. It's been wonderful. Uh, I know you each, I've heard you before, but. Ooh, hearing you fresh today is just charming, beautiful, inspiring, and um, we look to connect with you um, as we go forward on our collective journey to create a uh, environment in which we can be fully who we are, recognized by everyone, and that as Ita, if I can go back to that, we are not just pretenders to the thrones, we come from thrones, we know how they're built, we intend on sitting on our thrones. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good afternoon.